Hello and welcome to this fundamental series on using HTML5 and CSS3 to build web pages. This series is designed for somebody who has little or no experience with HTML or CSS but wants to get a quick overview of the major HTML5 elements as well as CSS3 selectors and properties and want some hands-on practice uh, as well in building web pages. If the terminology that I just used is a little foreign to you, perfect, you're in the right spot. I'll explain everything in due time. So my name is Bob Tabor and I typically talk about C Sharp, Visual Basic, ASP.NET and other related .NET topics on my website www.learnvisualstudio.net. HTML5 and CSS3 are foundational topics that you're going to need to learn prior to learning popular web technologies like JavaScript and ASP.NET. So I'm excited that Channel 9 has invited me to create this series of videos. It's extremely important that you learn these concepts. Soon you'll be able to build not only web pages but also native Windows 8 user interfaces using only HTML5 and CSS3. So it, it'll become increasingly a more and more vital skill uh, beyond web development. If you're already working with HTML and CSS and you just want to learn what's new in HTML version 5 and CSS level 3, then this is probably not the right place to start. I imagine that you're looking for a what's new in HTML5 or what's new in CSS3, and that is not what this series is all about. This is going to cover material that you probably already know, as well as the most pertinent HTML5 and CSS3 additions for absolute beginners to web development. So again, your time is probably better spent somewhere else, quite frankly. All right, so here's what I want to accomplish in this series. We're going to start by building a complete example. Uh, now, we're not going to win any design awards, but it's still going to get us busy typing away uh, and writing both HTML5 and CSS3. And then next, I'm going to dissect the HTML5 syntax. And in the course of this discussion, I hope to change any preconceived ideas that you might have about web design. Perhaps you're thinking I'm going to show you how to create beautiful web pages. Uh, that's not exactly what I'm going to do here. My focus is going to be on creating semantically correct web pages. That is at the heart of the newest features that have been added and offered by HTML5. If you don't know what I mean by that, then I assure you by the end of the series, it'll become firmly cemented in your mind. Then we're gonna talk about topics most developers skip over, thinking that they're not all that important, like doc types and validation and char sets, uh, M's versus pixels versus percentages and other geeky stuff. It's the good stuff that makes most normal people's eyes glaze over whenever you talk to them about it. And then we're going to talk about the importance of separating structure from aesthetics by separating out the work that we delegate to HTML5 from the work that we delegate to CSS3. We're going to discuss cascading style sheets and demonstrate many categories of properties that can be modified uh, by the styles that we create. We're going to talk about the syntax, the units of measure, how to build reusable styles, and other best practices, and a bunch of other fun stuff. So my hope is that by the end of the series, you're going to be able to look at a web page that was developed by somebody else, and you'll be able to make sense of it. Uh, you'll be able to pick it apart, understand what they did, what technique they used, and you'll learn from them uh, as a result. My hope is that this series gets you oriented in the right direction towards learning more about web development. And to that end, in the final lesson in this series, I'm going to give you a list of about a dozen or so hot topics and other resources where you can continue on in your self-study. So let me give you a quick caveat before we begin. My goal is to teach you the basics of HTML5 and CSS3 in this course. However, I simply can't teach you how to make an aesthetically beautiful web page design because frankly, I don't know how. Uh, when I need an attractive, beautiful web page for my website. I work with a graphic designer or find a template and then license that for my website. When I worked in uh, corporate environments and built intranet applications using HTML and CSS, JavaScript and ASP.NET, the company usually had a team of web designers uh, that designed the web page background, the text, the images. And sometimes they did this by using a tool like Adobe, Adobe Photoshop. After the management team approved their designs, then they would give it to the developers who would then splice up and implement 
that design using just HTML and CSS. Now, as a result, I got pretty good at taking somebody else's vision and their design and then implementing that in HTML and CSS code. Uh, there are many courses there are many websites, there are many books that would love to teach you how to become a graphic designer. That is not what we're going to do here in this series. You'll be learning from a decidedly developer-centric perspective, okay? Furthermore, this series is not meant to be an exhaustive reference for HTML5 or CSS3. Beyond the standards document that all web browser vendors are encouraged to follow, I'm really not familiar with any single best source for this information. I'm sure there's one out there. But what I usually do is uh, I know that something exists, I need a little more information about it, and then I just go out on the internet and do a search on my favorite search engine. Uh, and fortunately, there are tens of thousands of websites that post HTML and CSS tips and tricks and I generally purchase a book or maybe I'll find a little cheat sheet on the internet that'll help me remember the syntax of a given element or what have you. These are all helpful and perhaps in the comments below, you and your fellow students can exchange links for the best resources that are out there. Finally, there are many great tools that'll help you to author web pages. There are even free tools from Microsoft that provide many amenities as you create your code, including HTML and CSS hints as you type, a design view that allows you to get a quick preview of your web page without having to load it into a web browser and a lot more. However, just to keep things extremely simple, I'm gonna utilize two tools that I know that you already have installed on your Windows computer, no matter whether you're running Windows 95 or running the latest, greatest operating system. I'm gonna be using Notepad, that's right, just Notepad, and Internet Explorer. I'm gonna type the code into Notepad, I'm gonna save the file, and then I'm gonna open it up in Internet Explorer. Now, since this is a series of videos on HTML version 5, you're going to need a web browser that will support HTML5. So you're going to need a relatively newer release of Internet Explorer. I'm going to be using Internet Explorer 9.0, and you should feel confident using version 9 or later if it's available to you. All right, after you finish this course, assuming that you are going to progress down a developer track and not a graphic designer track, I'd recommend following up by learning about JavaScript. And a great place to learn about JavaScript is my JavaScript Fundamental Series, which is also free here on Channel 9. And then with my C Sharp or Visual Basic Fundamental Series, also here for free on Channel 9. Then you should finally be able to move on to ASP.NET, and I have a number of great ASP.NET courses on my own website, www.learnvisualstudio.net. Please free, uh, feel free to drop, uh, drop by and check it out. Uh, if you follow that path, you're going to be well positioned to build dynamic, data-driven websites for small business clients or work in an IT department as a software developer uh, at larger enterprises. Again, I'll have more to say about where to go from here at the very end in Lesson 18. Okay, before we get started, the videos embedded on the webpage on Channel 9 uh, are presented somewhat smaller than how I originally record them, which is in high def, 1280 by 720. Now, I'll increase the font size of the text that I type in the notepad. However, if the text seems obscured or difficult to read, then it may have to do with the speed of your internet connection. In that case, you may want to download the videos to your computer first and watch them there. Also, you should be able to watch full screen. Take a moment to make sure uh, you can see where to download the code on the pages that you're currently viewing uh, these videos from, where you can download the video itself, how to go full screen in the video's player controls, and so on. Finally, you are in control of the viewing experience. To get the most out of this or any video series, you should become an active learner. Uh, type the code in yourself to build muscle memory and to force your brain to understand what it is that the speaker is attempting to explain. Pause. Rewind the video. Ask questions in the comments area below the video. Active learners always learn more quickly. Commit the time and you'll have these ideas under your belt in no time at all. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. In the next lesson, we're going to build our first HTML5 web page. That's pretty exciting stuff. I want to encourage you to get a plan in place to follow along and enjoy the entire process of learning. You can do this. It's fun. It's exciting. And we'll see you in the next lesson. Thank you.
In this lesson, I want to build an entire HTML5 web page from beginning to end. And the purpose of this exercise is to familiarize ourselves with some of the most common HTML5 tags, as well as become familiar with the workflow of formatting an HTML5 document. Now, my focus is going to be giving semantic meaning to the sections of our document by using HTML5 tags. Uh, I'm not going to worry about the aesthetics or the beauty of the final result. I'm going to worry about that beginning in the next lesson, okay? So let's go ahead and get started. Like I said in the introduction, I'm simply going to use Windows Notepad and then a version of Internet Explorer that can uh, fully render HTML5 uh, tags. And so that means I need to use 9.0 or greater. If you don't have Internet Explorer 9.0 or greater already installed, please stop the video, take a few moments to uh, to update to the latest version of Internet Explorer. Otherwise, you're not going to get the results that you would expect by trying to learn HTML5 in this series of lessons. Okay? So once you get to the end of this lesson, undoubtedly, you're going to have questions. Why did he do that? What does that mean? Okay, that's great. You should have unanswered questions once you finish this lesson. All those questions, I promise, they'll be answered throughout the remainder of this series of lessons. So don't get discouraged. Uh, I can't emphasize this enough. At this point in time, I need you to follow along and do exactly what I do in your copy of Windows Notepad. Please do yourself a favor and follow along by actually typing the code. Uh, this is easily the best way to learn don't cheat yourself. You've already invested the time to watch this video, so get the most from that investment by taking a few moments and making sure you do exactly what I do in your own copy of, uh, of this web page that we'll be building. Pause, rewind the video if you need to, but make sure that you follow along. All right, and to follow along, what you're going to need to do is download a file called Lesson2.zip, or whatever they called it once they uploaded it to Channel 9. Uh, download that file, and you should be able to see that there's a Lesson02 file inside of that zip file. And you'll have three subfolders, a before, an after, and then a work folder. And so the thought process is this. I have all of the files you need to begin this lesson here in the before folder. So in this case, I'm going to select all these files and copy them. And then I'm going to paste them in the work folder where I'll do the majority of my messy work, okay? And then at the very end, I'll copy my workout into the, uh, whoops, into the after folder so that you can compare the work that you've done with the work that I've done, all right? And you can see uh, uh, how, it all, how it all goes. So I would encourage you to follow that exact same uh, process throughout the remainder of these lessons as you're following along. Uh, one other thing, um, you'll see in my version of Notepad, I have increased the size of the font significantly for your benefit. If you're streaming this video on Channel 9 and that looks garbled to you, if you cannot read that, this means that you need to download and watch the video locally from your own computer. That streaming is just not going to work from you possibly due to the speed of your internet connection and the way that Silverlight works, okay? So just wanted to, to make sure you understand that. Go full screen if you need to in order to see uh, things clearly. So with all of that, we've already copied our work into the work folder. I'm gonna double click the before.txt file. And what I've created here are a, uh, two articles and I wanna keep them on the same web page. I'm gonna use this as the basis for the web page that we're gonna create. These two articles are helpful uh, because we get to format them, but also because they have some beginning information that every web developer needs to know. Now, I could read this all to you in a camera, which is gonna be kind of boring, or you could just read it for yourself as you're working through this example, which I thought would be probably kill two birds with one stone. Also notice that because this is such a long, long, long document, and I've already recorded this video once and realized how long it was, uh, I have gone and added some HTML tags to several different key spots. So we'll be skipping over many of these definitions of paragraphs. This tag defines an opening paragraph tag and a closing paragraph tag. We'll talk about that more a little bit later, but I just wanted to point out to you that I've already done some pre-formatting of this article for you just to save a little time, okay? And then if you scroll down, scroll down, scroll down, scroll down, you'll see a bunch of double lines. I used equal signs. And this is where one article ends and the other, other article begins. We'll, we'll chop this out at some point during this video. OK, 
okay? So here we go, we're gonna open this up. I'm gonna select it all by hitting Control-A on my keyboard and then Control-C to copy it to the clipboard. I'm gonna open up a second copy of Notepad and I'm gonna paste it in. This time, what I'm gonna do is click File, Save As in the new file and I'm going to navigate to my uh, Lesson 02 folder, the work folder, okay? I'm gonna change the save as type from text documents to all files. I'm going to change the encoding from ANSI to UTF-8 and I'll discuss UTF-8 very briefly in lesson four. Just follow along for now. And then I'm gonna type in lesson 02, no spaces, dot HTML and then click the save button. And now to verify that I did this correctly, I'm gonna go back to Windows Explorer, look at my work folder, and I should see this lesson02.html page. Uh, you can see it has an Internet Explorer logo if that indeed is set to be your default browser. Great. Okay, so um, we're on our way. If we were to try to open this up, you can see that since I've added some formatting, we get some paragraph uh, uh, distinctions here, but there's very little formatting involved, and now we're gonna set, uh, set our minds to adding the rest of the HTML5 required to make this a real, real web page. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started at the very top of the page. I'm gonna use angle brackets. The angle brackets are right above the comma and the period key. They're used uh, exclusively in HTML, and so you're gonna to need to become very familiar with those keys. I will, you'll be typing them tens of thousands of times throughout the course of your career, okay? And so we're gonna open one up. So let me just say this, the opening and closing of a of angle brackets represents a tag in HTML. Like you saw a little bit of, ago, you create a tag by giving the tag a name. In this case, that's a paragraph tag. Usually what you do is you create an opening paragraph tag and then a closing paragraph tag. They look identical except for the leading forward slash. So this would dictate a paragraph and anything in between those, the opening and closing paragraph tags would be formatted as a paragraph in your document. Now you can create other things, uh, other information inside of this. For example, if I wanted to put a hyperlink inside of it, I could do that, click here, but never would I take this anchor tag and put it outside of the paragraph. That would be improperly formed uh, because the paragraph tag started before the anchor tag, therefore the anchor tag must finish before the closing paragraph tag. All right, so this would be bad, this would be good. All right, and we'll talk about what all of these mean a little bit later. All right, so back up to the top. We're gonna open up an angle bracket, use the exclamation mark and type in doc type space lowercase HTML. That tells the world that you are creating an HTML5 document. All right, we'll talk about what doc types are in, in lesson number four, so let's not worry about them right now. Uh, I think it's also important to notice that even though we talked about opening and closing, some HTML tags do not need a closing tag. So you don't need that in some cases. Now, which cases? That's where some, a little, there's a little bit of a learning curve, admittedly. Um, there's also a instance where you might see in older versions of people's work in HTML, uh, something like this, where there is a a forward slash at the very end of the tag. This is not something that's necessary in HTML version five, but you might see it in previous versions of HTML. That's just uh, roughly the equivalent of doing this. It's just a shortened version of it by creating a self-enclosing tag, and it only works in certain circumstances, and it's only necessary in other versions of HTML, all right? So by and large, just follow and do exactly what I do, and we'll learn the rest later, okay? All right, so let's move on. Uh, every HTML document is defined by an opening HTML and a closing HTML tag, like so. So I went to the very bottom and typed the closing. So that defines the boundaries of the HTML page that we're creating. Go back to the top. Every HTML page is composed of two parts. There's a head and a body. The head section has extra information that's needed to render your web page properly, but it's never seen as you display it into a web browser, all right? And we'll talk about this more in a little bit. So let's begin with a head and a slash head, just get that ready. 
And below it, I'm gonna type in body and then, whoops, body and opening body tag. And then near the very end of the web page where I type the HTML tag, right above that, inside of it, I'm gonna type in the slash body tag. All right, so now we have the makings of a real HTML page. Uh, one other thing I wanna do, I don't have to do this, many people do not, but I'm choosing to do it. I'm gonna add an attribute. Now, attributes are extra information that help uh, define properties and attributes of a given tag. We'll see this a lot in the remainder of the series. So the first thing you type in is the attribute or properties name. In this case, I'm gonna define the language for this document. I'm gonna use the equal sign. So I'm gonna set this property, this attribute equal to open quote, close quote, and that says this is gonna be the value, and inside of that, I'm gonna type in the letters EN for English, okay? So, attributes or properties can be set in HTML tags by leaving a space in between the tag name and the attribute or property itself. We use the attribute or property name, an equal sign, indicating that we wanna set that property equal to, and then the value. Now, in HTML5, you might see some people leave off the double quotes, that's fine, I've chosen to include them, uh, and there's a technical reason why I'll discuss much, much later. All right, just I'm getting into the habit of doing that. If I have a second or third attribute, I can just continue to append them inside of the closing uh, angle bracket. Um, here is another uh, value and another, and I'm just making these up, okay? But you can see the pattern here is to continue to include spaces and then another property attribute name equal to another value okay let's delete all that junk and there we go looks great inside of the head i want to define the char set and we'll talk about what the char set is in lesson number four very briefly but for right now just follow along and do what i do i'm creating a meta tag i'm setting char set equal to open quote close quote Inside of there and inside of the quotes, I'm going to type in UTF-8. And then a close angle bracket. We'll talk about that later. And here I'm going to create a title for my document. And the title will be displayed in either the title bar in Windows, like you see here, Lesson 02 Notepad, or in the case of Internet Explorer, in the tab name above the page you're currently viewing. Alright, so that's the purpose of the title, and I'm just going to grab this text right here and I'm gonna paste it. So I hit Control C, Control V. And now I'm gonna move on to the body section. And I'm gonna define some sections within the body. I'm going to create a part that is called the header information. I'm gonna create a section of my document that'll be like the main section where all the articles reside. So we'll start the section and at the very, very bottom, prior to the copyright notice, I'm gonna end the section. While I'm down here, I'm gonna create a footer section or a footer to define this area down here as uh, the, uh, the bottom most uh, additional information about, in this case, a web page. We'll talk about head, section, footer in like lesson six, I believe. So just table that thought for now. I'm gonna go back up to the top. Now that I've created the sections, I know that there are two major portions of this section. There are two articles, all right? So I'm gonna open up an article, and then I'm gonna look for that line that I drew in this document to, to delineate the two articles. There we go. So here I'm gonna end this article, and I'm gonna begin a new article. and I'm gonna delete this big line, don't need that anymore. And I'm gonna to go to the very end of the document, and right here before the end of the section, I'm gonna type in slash article so I can completely enclose it. Great, I'm gonna save all my work. And now, let's just open her up in Internet Explorer and see what we have, and you're gonna to say to yourself, boy, this doesn't look any different than before. That's correct. At this point, we're not styling any of these tags. We're merely giving 
um, meaning to the document, to the sections of the document. And I'll explain why we want to do that and why that's so important in HTML5 in the next lesson or in lesson number four, actually. Okay. All right. So, but we can see in our tab, we can see the head uh, the title that we typed in. So we have that going for us, right? Let's close that down. Let's go back to the very top and work on our header. And the header is where we're going to create ostensibly a logo and maybe some navigation. Uh, so here I'm going to use an H1, which is basically saying a very important piece of information and then an H2, a slightly less important piece of information. We'll define what it exactly means later. And then I'm gonna wrap these in a header group. So I'm gonna say these belong together and should be treated a little bit differently than they would normally be treated in the body of my document or in the article section of the document. We'll talk about this later. Also inside of the header, I wanna create, in fact, I'm gonna do some indentation here. Let me push some of these tags two spaces in, two spaces in, so I get this nice hierarchy. And it's visually for me, not because it's gonna improve the document in any way, but it helps me to see the overall structure of the document in this way. All right, and so I'm gonna also add a navigation area in this header section. And to create that navigation section, I'm gonna use a list of items. This list of items will be unordered, therefore I'm creating an unordered, a U list, unordered list, and it's gonna consist of three items, list items. So I'm just gonna go ahead and create a list item, and then I'm gonna copy, paste, go to the next line and paste. Also, uh, so let's go ahead and just create home, about, and then uh, contact. And so if this was the beginning of a larger website, we might have navigation to several different pages of our website. You've seen this hundreds of times through the, uh, through the websites that you visited, I'm sure. Okay, and additionally, at this point, let's just look at how this is rendered in the web browser briefly as a series of bullet points. We'll change how it's rendered later, but none of those were hyperlinks. And so we wanna add an anchor tag and we're gonna to point to a specific place where that will be, that link will be referencing. So that when the user clicks it, they'll go to the location inside of that href attribute that I've left blank for now. And since I don't wanna spend much time on this, I'm not gonna give it an actual location. I could do something like um, bing.com here, but I don't really wanna do that at the moment and I don't have any other web pages, so I'm just gonna create these placeholders. I'm simply putting a pound symbol uh, as a placeholder in each of the hrefs for now. Maybe someday we'll come back and link those up correctly to other web pages on our website, other websites, or what have you. All right, now I've highlighted this entire navigation section. I'm gonna copy it because I wanna put it in the footer as well. So I want it, like most web pages do, to have navigation at the very top and at the very bottom of my web page. Add some spacing here and there, and now I'm gonna go right back up to the top. So I have my header in great shape. Now let's move on to our main section, which contains two articles. Let's start with the first article. Here we have a title and then a section of the document or a part of the document. So the title of the article, I'm gonna give that a headline or a header of H1. That'll make it the most prominent part of this article. And then since the first paragraph or two is an introduction, I'm gonna give this introduction word a header two, which makes it a little less important as we think of a hierarchy or an outline of our document. And I'll do the same thing with this brief technical overview of the World Wide Web. I'm gonna give that an H2 and a closing H2 tag, all right? Um, while I'm here, you'll notice that I I don't have paragraph tags defining this paragraph beginning with the words in this article I'll describe blah blah blah. So let's go ahead and add a paragraph tag before and a, par a closing paragraph tag after that paragraph. The paragraph that begins, the World Wide Web started out as a means for sharing and so forth. I'm going to add a paragraph tag beginning, beginning and then an ending paragraph tag. And then from that point on, you can see I've already taken the liberty of adding paragraph tags through the remainder of this document. So that'll be the last time that you'll need to define those. Great. 
All right, let's scroll down to the next interesting part, which is you'll see something that starts with HTTP message.gif. And here what I want to do is include an image inside of a figure. And a figure, if you think about books that you've read, it's something that's important to, uh, to the discussion, but it's included outside of the paragraph for reference sake. It could be even included on another page and we're merely referencing it here. So I want to display this image and you'll notice it's this image uh, HTTP message here that I've added to my work folder when we first got started. And so what I'm going to start off by doing is defining a figure and I'm going to enclose this whole thing in a closing figure. And then what I want to do is start creating uh, the image. So I'm going to go two spaces in, open angle bracket, IMG, space, and then I'm going to use this file name as the source property, src equals, that means where am I going to find this file? I'm going to set it equal to the file name on my, uh, in the same folder where you find the lesson 02 HTML file. And then what I want to do is add an alternate message and this will show up for those people who can't see the image for some reason. Uh, perhaps their browser won't load it, Perhaps they're vision impaired and their screen reader will read aloud this alternate uh, message instead of uh, displaying a useless image in their case, okay? So then notice at the very end of that alt that I set, I close the image tag and I don't need a slash image in this case and I don't need a self enclosing image. Now you might see this in older versions of HTML but you don't need it in HTML5. Furthermore, I'm gonna add a fig caption around the text. And so this will associate this caption below this image that'll be displayed. So let's see what the result of this is in our web browser. Scroll down a little bit and you can see that here we have the image displayed. Furthermore, we have this figure caption displayed underneath our image. Awesome. Okay, and continuing down, we'll get another opportunity. So I'm not going to spend as much time. I'm just gonna define an open and a closing figure. I'll define an image. I'll set the source equal to this other www.diagram.gif alt equal and then I'm going to just use this text a diagram of route uh, or route from the user's request to the web server back again and then I'll close the, the image go to the next line two spaces fig caption and then I'll close the fig caption like so okay now let's save that and let's see how that looks in our web browser all right, there's our first image and there's our second image. And noted it's just a, a neat little image that shows uh, the progression from uh, the client to the server and back to the client again. And it uh, explains what each of these little callouts are for. All right, let's continue on. All right, what are domain names? I'm gonna wrap that in yet another level down in our imaginary outline that we're creating for this document by giving it an H3. Uh, heading so the h3 heading will be used to make it even less prominent than the others Okay, here we have another opportunity for some formatting What my intent is is to kind of format it the way that it looks here on screen However, if we were to look at this paragraph as it's defined currently uh, It's not going to uh, create the proper uh, Vertical spacing in this case what I want to do. I still want to keep it all as one paragraph because uh, in my way of thinking, it's still all one complete thought that needs to stay together. So I'm thinking semantically, I'm thinking about the meaning of the tags that I'm using, not just how it's going to look on screen. And yet still in this context, I need to have some spacing. So I'm going to add this break. In fact, I'm going to add two of them, these breaks, BR tags. All right. And when I do that, let's refresh the browser and then take a look at this again. It's still one paragraph, but there have been a line break and a line break. 
okay? That's exactly how we want this to work. We have another opportunity to do this below. So we can see we have a paragraph beginning and at the very end a paragraph ending. So what I wanna do is add a series of BRs, pretty much everywhere where there's an empty space at the end of the line. I'm gonna add a series of these. And I didn't have to do it. I could like remove all the spaces like so. That would work just fine. White space does not matter in HTML. It will be largely ignored with rare exception, okay? So let's go ahead and refresh the page and see that we get the formatting that indeed we want for that paragraph. Great, let's move on here. All right, again, in my imaginary outline, I want this to have a little less prominence. It's a sub point of something we spoke about earlier. So I'm wrapping it in a beginning and an ending H3, header three tag. Keep going down here. And in the recap, I'm gonna come back out one level of my imaginary outline and wrap that in a header two. All right, and then here we have another interesting situation. What I wanna do is render uh, you can see that there's, uh, from a purely technical perspective, you should now understand a few things. Uh, first of all, second, hopefully, third, hopefully, fourth, hopefully, fifth, hopefully, and so on. Uh, and what I want to do is create an ordered list of these items because they all need to be kind of understood together and in a certain order. So I'm going to create a closing OL tag. And I'm going to wrap each of these items with a beginning list item and an ending list item tag. Right. Again, beginning list item, ending list item, beginning list item, ending list item, beginning list item, and ending list item. And finally, I remind myself not to type so much next time, a beginning and ending list item. All right, and then at the very end of that, in a closing ordered list tag. All right, so let's save all that, and now let's see how it's rendered in the browser. All right, and notice the default rendering uses this ordered list, and instead of bullets, it uses a numerical scheme one, two, three, four, five. Okay, awesome. Now we may come back and change that at some point, but that's the default way that it's rendered in my web browser. And then we have one final note about our review, and I'm just gonna wrap that in an H2 and a closing H2. And that should be about it for our first article. So now let's move on to our second article. And here I'm going to add an H1 since it's the title of the article. And here I'm going to add another paragraph uh, tag around. There are four major parsing and rendering engines that are popular. And here the order doesn't matter. So I'm just going to use an unordered list to describe the four different parsing engines. And I'm going to wrap each of them in an LI and a closing LI. LI and a closing LI, LI, closing LI, LI, and closing LI. All right, how you doing? You hanging in there? It's a lot of work. Whoops, something looks not quite right. If I look at this web page and see that everything looks about the same, that tells me that I probably forgot or misspelled something on the very end right here. So let me look back at my work. Ah, uh, yes. I don't know what I was thinking. I started with an H1, but I ended with an LI. I can't talk and type at the same time, clearly. Let's save that. And now let's refresh. All right, and this is why I test often when I'm working to make sure that I catch problems as they pop up immediately. So you can see the unordered list rendered out as a series of bullet points. That's perfect, let's continue on. All right, what do I mean when I use the terms parse and render? Let's just wrap that in an H2. Make sure we type H2, okay. And then characteristics of an HTML5 web page, another H2 and slash H2. And here's an interesting dilemma that we have. Now, what I'm trying to do is describe 
the doc type element, much like what we created at the very top of our HTML page. But in this case, I want to render it to screen. Let's look at how it looks by default. Uh, notice it just leaves off the opening and closing um, uh, angle brackets. Well, actually, retype this. It's not even showing the doc type, okay, at all. So it's just got these blank types. It's ignoring everything. And the reason is because we need to use uh, HTML encodings instead of these reserved characters. So in this case, I need a less than symbol. So I'm going to use the ampersand LT for less than and then a semicolon. And we'll go to the very end and we'll use a greater than symbol. So the ampersand GT semicolon. All right, so this and this uh, designates uh, that we're going to use an HTML encoding and then whatever's in the middle will be uh, a special symbol. So there are like dozens of these HTML encodings to get around special symbols. Um, so for example, if I wanted to use an ampersand, uh, it would be largely ignored, but we could do ampersand AMP and then a semicolon at the end. So you really, in this case, need to find a cheat sheet or reference book that will show you all of the possible uh, HTML encodings. I don't want to take the time to go through that. That's more of a reference material sort of thing. But you'll at least understand why they exist. Now when we refresh this page, and we can see that that tag is represented to the user correctly um, as an HTML tag. And yet, behind the scenes, we're not using the greater or less than symbol per se, just the HTML escape or encoding version of it. Okay, let's continue on. And we are almost, almost, almost done. So I'm gonna go to the very last section here, and I'm going to add an aside, and I'm gonna intentionally misspell this as AIS because that'll be a great lead in for the next video, all right? You won't notice the the problem in the web browser per se, but when we go and try to see if there's any errors with our web page and what we've done, we'll find the errors then. Okay, so um, let's wrap this final conclusion in an H2 and then wrap this final paragraph with opening and a closing paragraph tag. And then here at the very bottom in the footer section, we want this is like lawyer speak, right? The copyright notice and all of that. So we're going to use a tag called small. Now that doesn't mean that this is actually gonna be rendered out small per se. We're giving meaning to this content saying it's like legalese. We'll talk about this more in lesson number five or six. Can't remember which, okay? Um, here is another instance where there's an HTML encoding for the copyright. Uh, in some cases, like the copyright, for example, you're encouraged in HTML5 to not use the HTML encoding. Instead, what you need to do is bring up a character map in Windows, and I think every version of Windows has this. And then in my case, I'm using the Courier new font. I'm gonna find the copyright notice. It's right here, and I'm gonna select it and copy it, and then I'm gonna paste it over what I have there and that should retain its formatting because I saved as UTF-8. Now let's see and make sure that this web page still looks good, renders well as we scroll through it and it looks perfect. Okay so this is where I'm going to stop the video. We're done giving structure and meaning to our document. In the next video we're going to apply cascading style sheets to make it look a little prettier. Okay we'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Okay, undoubtedly at this point you have lots of questions about HTML5, what we did, why do we do it. Like I said, that's great. Beginning in lesson number four, we're going to examine virtually every single tag and concept that we added to the document in the previous lesson. Also, I'm sure that you were left completely unimpressed by the visual stylings, the design, the aesthetic quality of the page that we created. So that's really the focus of this lesson, to demonstrate the thought process and the workflow of laying out and applying styles to our HTML5 web pages. There will be plenty that you will not understand, but please follow along 
along, do what I do. Some of it will make sense. Some of it will form uh, questions in your mind that will be then answered when we get to that point in the series of lessons beginning in lesson number 12. Okay, so before we get started, there's some unfinished business that we need to attend to. Uh, it came to my attention that we have some mistakes, not only the ones that I intended to put in there, but then also ones that I that were added unintentionally. So make sure that you download the uh, Lesson03 code from wherever you're currently watching this video or wherever you originally downloaded it from. Inside of that folder, we're gonna have a before folder that will be an exact copy of where we ended in Lesson2. I just renamed the file. Okay, and so I'm going to copy all these assets and then I'm going to go back to the work folder and paste them all in and this is where we're going to do the majority of our work uh, for this lesson. Okay, so next up what we need to do is open up our lesson03.html page and what I want to do is run our web page through a validator and a validator will check uh, the code that we've written to make sure that it conforms to the standards that we set or the contract that we said uh, that we're adhering to whenever we declare the doc type at the uh, top of this HTML document. We'll talk about this in the next lesson. So what I want to do is open up my web browser and go to a popular validator. It's called validator.nu and I'm going to choose the text field for the validator input. I'm going to go back to my document, hit Control A, Control C to copy the entire document out of my clipboard. Go back to Internet Explorer, Control A to select all the example HTML that they create for us, and then Control V to paste in our page. And I'm going to click the Validate button. And as soon as I do, we're going to get a couple of errors. And so uh, the first one, it gives us a line number and a column, uh, but and it kind of gives us a general idea of where and what the problem is. Now, unfortunately, because I have word wrap on, it's not gonna be exactly in the line that it said it was in. However, I happen to know that the problem here is that I opened an H1 tag, but I didn't close the H1 tag. I just created another opening H1 tag. So if I add a forward slash and click save, that should fix that problem. We'll check into that. Um, one more time in just a moment once we make all of our changes. Now I'm going to scroll down to where the two articles kind of butt up against each other when one article ends and the other one begins and I intended to put an HR which stands for a horizontal rule but it has a semantic meaning uh, of separating two ideas or, or two unrelated items and so we'll come back to the semantic meaning of uh, HR uh, much later in the series, but I wanted to include it here so that you can be exposed to it. And then I want to go to the very bottom of this document. If we were to look at the uh, the other error, this number five, a stray n tag AIS. Now this is the one that we planted intentionally. I have an opening aside and a closing tag that I mistyped intentionally. So I'm going to rename that aside. So closing aside, save all these changes that I made. Control A to select everything and Control C to copy it. I'm going to go back and revalidate this document by clicking Control A to select everything in the text field and then Control V to paste in our updated version and click the validate button one more time. And this time we get the document validates uh, message success. Okay, so we can continue on now. That's awesome. I'm going to close this down and uh, we do need to make an addition now to our lesson03.html file, we're going to attach an external cascading style sheet file to this document so that when our web browser loads this up, it's going to see the link that we created and it's going to go out and then request that resource from the web server or in this case, just our local desktop machine. So to create one of those, I'm going to go underneath the title, but before the end uh, of the head section, I'm going to create link rel or relationship is style sheet that's the relationship of this link to uh, to this HTML document type equals text slash CSS no spaces href equals and then the name of the file that we want to include so styles dot CSS and then finally media equals screen and we'll talk about media elements later. I'm going to save that. And now I'm going to open up a second version of Notepad. 
and I'm going to create the styles.css uh, file. So just so we have something in there to begin with, I'm going to style the entire body setting the font for the entire document. So I'm going to select the body. So I'm creating a CSS selector and say basically I want to change the font family to Arial. However, in case they don't have the Arial font on their computer, I'm going to say a worthy substitute would be Helvetica. And if they don't have either of those fonts, then any sans serif classification of font will do just fine. So now I'm going to file, save as. I'm going to make sure to navigate to the appropriate folder, the Lesson 03 work folder. I'm going to change the save as tied to all files, change the encoding to UTF-8, and I'm going to call this styles.css, and then click save. Now, if we did everything correctly, I should be able to open this file and we will see a Arial or rather sans serif font. And we do. And simply by sans serif, we don't see any of the decorative elements that we would normally see in the default, fi uh, default font, which would be like a, a Times New Roman that has little uh, flares off on the ends of the S's and the, the E's look different and the A's look different. Okay, so we're working with an Arial font and that much is obvious if you're familiar with uh, fonts and typography. Great. Okay, so what we've been able to accomplish here so far is to create our first style. We have created a style by setting one attribute to a new value. Okay? And so now it's time for us to think about how we want to lay out our web page. In my mind, I've already given this a lot of thought. I want three distinct sections. There will be a head, there will be kind of the main area where all the text will reside, and then the very bottom, a small footer. Now the head and the footer, I want to be black with white text. In the main section, I want there to be white text with a black font. Kind of the chrome around the entire document, I want to be a dark gray color. I also want there to be a thick border all the way around uh, the document, a black border. And as far as the header is concerned and the footer, I want this channel 9 and HTML5 and CSS fundamentals to be on the left hand side. And then I want to represent this navigation area over on the right hand side. And I want it to be horizontal, not vertical the way that we see here. And I want to get rid of those little bullet points. Furthermore, I think at the very end of the document, we have this aside and I want to format that specially. I'm going to put it in a, a smaller font. I'm going to give it a bright green background and I'm going to give it a, uh, a green uh, uh, border with rounded corners so that we can exercise that new feature in Internet Explorer 9's CSS3 capabilities. And uh, the same would be true then with the footer area. I want this copyright notice on the left and then again our navigation to be on the right hand side. So to accomplish all that, I'm going to go back to the body and I'm going to add that dark gray color which will provide the chrome around the background of the web page. So here we go. I'm going to set the background color colon pound symbol 333 333. And so I happen to know that this is a hexadecimal value that represents a dark gray color. So I'm going to save that and now if I refresh my web page you can see that it indeed turns the entire body of the document gray. And you might be thinking, well, that was counterproductive because don't we need some black area backgrounds and some white background uh, areas as well? So let's go ahead and then style up the three parts that we know comprise those sections. Uh, we have a header. We have the main section that contains the two articles. And then we also have a footer. And I'm going to make these the same in all three cases. Uh, I am going to, for example, uh, make the header width colon 80%. So that will make uh, the, the amount of horizontal space that it takes up less than the entire width of the browser, uh, leaving 20% as the chrome area to the left and the right. Okay. Now, let's just go ahead and uh, set the background color to black 
and then the foreground color for all the text inside of it, I'm gonna to set to white. Now notice in these two cases, I was able to use named colors instead of hexadecimal colors. When we get to the part where we're talking about colors, much later in this series, there's several different ways to define colors. These are just two of the more popular ways to do it. Uh, so let's just look at what we've accomplished here so far. Refresh our web page. And you can see, we definitely get this header section that's only 80% of the entire web page. The background is black, the channel nine and the HTML5 and CSS3 fundamentals is in white text, that's great. However, it's not centered and that's really what I want. So we're gonna have to use this little trick. We're gonna use margin dash right auto and margin left auto. And this is just one of many tricks that have been developed or have been realized over time to do things which would seem to be simple however require a few extra steps in cascading style sheets. So here we get, we have a centered area and that's awesome and I want to apply that same uh, that same styling then to the section and then the footer as well. So let's copy most of this and just paste it in both sections. However, in the section, I want to leave the color alone and set the background color to white. And save this, and now let's refresh. All right, so in a very short period of time, we've gotten a pretty nice little layout here. Great. So now we have some things like spacing, uh, we have margin and padding issues, and so let's go ahead and spend some time figuring out what we can do here to clean up some of these sorts of things. The first thing I want to do in the header was to add some padding around the inside of the header area uh, because all that text was butted up too close to the edges here and that makes me a little uncomfortable. So that gives us a little more spacing However, for my tastes, a little bit too much spacing, so we may come back and, and modify some parts of this. Also, uh, I don't like the fact that the text here in our paragraphs are butted up right against the side. So what I'll do is for every paragraph, I'm gonna set its padding, or I think probably, let's try margin instead. I think that's what I want. 10 pixels. Okay, so you can see we get 10 pixels, a small amount of padding, or rather margin area, between the text and the side here. Great. Furthermore, since we're working with that section, I want to place a border. And I'm going to define it longhand, so I'm going to set the border color to black the border style to solid and the border width to five pixels. And now we get this nice thick border all the way around. Awesome. The next thing I want to do is focus on the H1s and the H2s and the H3s below. There's not a lot of differentiation between them and so I'm going to set the default styles for each of those. Furthermore, this H1 doesn't look like this H1 so I want to standardize those sizes. So to do that, here I'm going to go arbitrarily here and just type in an H1, an H2, and an H3. And for the H1, I'm going to set its font size. 2EM, which means 200% of the default font size for the web browser. I'll set the font size to uh, 1.6 for the H2, and then the font size to 1.3 for the H3. So this basically says 60% larger than your normal uh, font size and 30% larger than the normal font size. That's used in the rest of the document. Okay, so let's go ahead and refresh and see what that does for us. All right, so now this definitely makes this much larger uh, and it makes the H2s considerably smaller and the H3s smaller yet, great. 
Uh, furthermore, if I look at this document, um, in both cases, I don't like how much vertical spacing there is between uh, the H1 and what's below it and above it. So I'm gonna modify that as well. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna reset it, both the margin and the padding to zero. And then I'm going to reset specifically the padding top to 10 pixels. So let's see what this does for us. Okay. Next up, let's deal with this H group, including the H1 and the H2. And what we're gonna do is treat this whole area inside here as 100%, and so we're gonna commit 70% of the space inside of here to this uh, header group, and then 30% of the space to this group. Furthermore, we're gonna move that all the way over here to the right-hand side. Um, and so let's go ahead and work on that. So here we go, H group. And we're going to set the H group to um, a width of 70% of its parent. And then uh, we'll float that to the left. Then we'll take the, uh, the nav section. And we're going to set its width to 30%. And we're going to float that to the right. Let's see what that does. All right, so this looks very odd right now because uh, we haven't finished quite yet. We have an issue that since we're using floated uh, uh, areas, our header uh, just doesn't know enough about what's inside of it to render it correctly. So what we're gonna have to do is do a little trick here with this header section and I'm going to add an overflow of hidden and see what if that helps the situation out a little bit. All right, and it does, great. Uh, let's go ahead and work on this nav section still. We're still not quite done with that. So let's go nav um, li, which means any child list item of the nav area I'm gonna float those left. Each list item will be floated left. And then for the nav unordered list tag, let's go ahead and set its list style type to none. That should get rid of the bullets to the left-hand side of each of the list items. So now let's refresh. All right, almost done here. Not enough space, so let's put a little margin to the right-hand side of each of these items. Uh, so let's go uh, margin, right, five pixels, and let's refresh. And that looks a lot better, great. All right, I'm still not really satisfied with this section. It just doesn't look good. Um, so what I'm gonna do is style just the H1 and the H2 that are inside of the H group. I'm gonna try and remove some of the from some of the dead space, make it kind of collapse up against itself. itself. And I'm gonna change the way that th this uh, is rendered to make it all caps. It'll be a small version of caps. So to do that, let's go to the H group, and right under that, I'm gonna go H group H1. So any H1 contained inside of an H group, and let's set the padding top. Let's just zero that out and see if that helps. And then I'm gonna also set the line height to one EM. So that should reduce the overall line height consumed by that header one. So hopefully that'll pull everything up together vertically. Furthermore, I'm gonna go H group H2 and we'll do something neat here. Text transform, spell it right here, transform. And we're gonna put uppercase, cool. And then we'll go font size 1.2 EM, so 20% larger than a normal um, uh, font. And I'm gonna go ahead and set its line height to one EM to reduce the amount of space it takes up uh, vertically. And that should be all I need to do. Let's see what that gets us here. 
So you notice the workflow, I make a small change, I test it, make a small change, test it. All right, so I like that it's kind of pulled itself up uh, a little bit more. Let me try one more thing on this H2. Uh, no, I think that's good. We'll leave it at that for now. That'll be good. One thing I'm not satisfied, however, is the amount of space that the header takes up relative to the amount of space that the section takes up. And I think there's a number of different ways to correct this. But if I were to add a padding around all sides, it would push everything out five pixels in every direction. And I think that'll be enough space to rectify this problem. So let's go back up to, let's find the section. And then I'm gonna just padding five pixels. And by setting one setting, it'll set it to the top, right, bottom, and left all at one time. I could specify individual values for each, but not gonna do it here. And you can see that that works. Everything lines up really nicely now. Great, getting close. Um, hey, while we're here, let's go ahead and take care of this image. I, I'd like to push the images to the right-hand side. Uh, I'd like the text to flow around them. I would like also to have a drop shadow. So to uh, make that happen, let's go ahead and right underneath the paragraph tag, I'm gonna do an image. And inside of the image, I'm going to set uh, the float equal to the right. So I'm gonna make it butt up against the right-hand side instead of the left-hand side. Uh, let me set a margin. And I'm going to specify each side individually, starting at top, and think about a clock. It starts at midnight and works its way around. So the top value, I'll have no margin. To the right-hand side, no margin. To the bottom, I want to put 10 pixels between the image and any text that might try to butt up to the bottom of that image. And then also the same to the left-hand side. So let's see how that works. All right, so that works. And you can see we get spacing here and some spacing here of ten, at least 10 pixels. All right, so that's good. Now let's work on that drop shadow behind it. And to create that, I'm going to just go... Um, box shadow and this is kind of a convoluted set of, of values but they have to do with offsets the amount of uh, how precise or how blurry the uh, the drop shadow is and so on and then this would be the color of the drop shadow a light gray color all right so let's take a look at what that produces for us. All right, so a nice, subtle drop shadow, which makes it pop off the page just a little bit. Very nice. All right, so let's move all the way down to the footer and finish that up. I don't like how wimpy the footer is. I'd like it to have a much more pronounced height, but the content inside of it at this point isn't gonna really take up that much space. So what I'll do is, um, find the footer and I'm going to set the height to 50 pixels. That should make it a little thicker and bulkier. All right, that's nice. Still have some issues with uh, not quite coming out to the full uh, to the full width that we need to match everything else that we've done. And so let me add a padding like we did above. And I think uh, 10 pixels should do it. So let's go padding and get 10 pixels around every side you just have to type it in one time save that and now I'll refresh one more time and now it looks great and there's probably more I could do to pull this section up more to the upper right hand corner doing so would probably affect how it works here as well but I'm gonna leave that alone the final thing that I'm going to do is deal with this little aside area if you recall we're gonna give it uh, a smaller font we're going to make it uh, smaller than the rest of the text. We're going to give it a bright green background and then uh, a border with rounded corners. So that should be exciting. Let's go ahead right before the footer here and aside. And so I'm going to make this 80% of its parent, which will be the article, which would be the section. We're going to use that trick where we center it. So margin right auto, margin left auto. And we'll make the, um, we'll set the uh, 
the font size a little bit smaller, so we'll use 0.8 EM. Okay, so let's see what we get so far. Actually, let's do one or two more things and then let's take a look at it. Look at the background. I happen to have a bright green background color here in hexadecimal. So um, you can do hexes in capitals or lowercase, doesn't matter. So EEFF99. Save that. Now let's see what we get. We'll go all the way to the bottom. Okay, so uh, it's we're off to a good start. We need some padding, and then we obviously need that, that border with the rounded corners. Um, so let's add padding to all sides, 20 pixels. And then we're going to set a border. Uh, and I'm just going to use some shorthand here. Instead of using each of the individual border properties like we did here, we can use a shortcut and just do one pixel solid and then give it a color. Uh, 696 and that would imply a second set of 696 but we'll just use a shortened form in this case the hexadecimal color the dark green color all right so let's look at that awesome one last thing we need that rounded corner so to get that we're going to use border dash radius and set that to 20 pixels. If I wanted a smaller border radius, a tighter radius, I can make this like 10. If I wanted it larger, I can make it 50 or something very pronounced. Also make it make it almost look like a pill shape. Uh, so now we get the round corners. Awesome. And as I just comb through it here one last time, this looks about like what I had envisioned in my mind. And you could continue tweaking uh, for for days and days. Uh, it's not the best looking web page I've ever seen, but it's certainly not the worst out there on the internet. So all uh, good for at least one video. It served its purpose. It was a, a brief whirlwind introduction to cascading style sheets. I'm sure you have tons of questions. I used a dizzying number of CSS properties and I didn't try to explain what all of the special characters like PX and EM and this uh, just short uh, briefly uh, explain the hexadecimal version of a color and things of that nature all of that will be explained in due time when we get to those parts of the series so let's go ahead and push forward into the next lesson so we can get started talking about html5 see you in the next video thank you Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. In this lesson, we're going to dive deep into the code that we wrote in the previous lesson to make sure we really understand the HTML that we're writing. And to that end, make sure that you've downloaded the code that's associated with this lesson. It's available from wherever you're currently streaming the video or wherever you originally downloaded the video file from. Inside of that zip file, there should be a folder called Lesson04. Inside of that folder, there should be a test.html page which we'll use in just a moment, and then a before folder. And the before folder is merely a snapshot of where we left off from in the previous lesson. So you'll see the lesson03.html page, the styles.css page, and then a couple of image files. And so what we want to do is open up the lesson03.html file in Notepad. There are many different techniques. Use the technique you're most comfortable with. For me, I'm going to right click and select Open with Notepad. And so ultimately, you should see on your screen what I'm looking at on my screen, okay? So in lesson two, we worked together to add HTML5 tags to an existing document in order to give it structure. And then in lesson three, we applied styles to our HTML5 document using cascading style sheets. And I hope by now you have clear in your mind the difference between HTML5 and CSS. Uh, HTML5 is for structuring the content. CSS3 is for styling the content. So we have two concerns here and we're keeping them separated. Content and presentation, content structure, and styling information. We keep them separated and there are some big benefits to keeping the style sheet information separated out, even separated out into its own file. Uh, the biggest of which is that we can apply those styles to many web pages in the same website or in many different websites. So sure, you could mix the styling information directly in with your HTML, and you'll see many pages on the internet do this. You'll see that even I will use this technique a couple of times uh, just to show you how it's done. But 
you'll quickly see that you should never take this tactic whenever you're building real web pages because it'll make it difficult to reuse those styles in the future. Furthermore, there's a larger philosophical issue here as well regarding semantic purity, and we'll talk about semantic purity later in this video. Okay, so let's dive into the HTML5 page that we're looking at right here that we created lesson two and three. I want to explain why we did what we did, and I want to start at the very top and work my way down. So first of all, we have this doc type, angle brackets, exclamation mark, doc type in all caps, and then lowercase HTML. Looks very official, right? But what is it doing? Well, it's simply an instruction to the web browser explaining which set of rules that it should use to interpret this, or rather parse this document. Each version of HTML has a different set of rules, and those rules are set out in, ideally, a specification. Uh, in lesson three, I showed you an HTML5 validator. Remember the validator.nu? We used it to ensure that we were following the rules of HTML5 in our document, and it, remember, we weren't. It found a couple of mistakes, and we fixed those. It used the doc type declaration to determine which set of rules that it should check our document against. So this HTML5 doc type is pretty simple to remember. For contrast sake, take a look at what the doc type from a previous version of HTML, XHTML 1.0 strict. It looks something like this as you see on screen. XHTML 1.0 strict, strict essentially treated your web page as an XML document. Now I'm tempted here to go off into a long explanation of what XML is and the history of how XHTML 2.0 died in favor of HTML5, but for the sake of brevity, just know that there's an interesting backstory about how HTML5 came about in the first place. And keeping that in mind, let's go ahead and just keep moving forward here with the important stuff. So compared to XHTML 1.0 strict in general, uh, HTML5 is really laid back. In fact, if you, we open up validator.nu and we were to go to this validator input and set that to text field and it gives you this little template here. Let's delete everything out of it except just the title and the doc type, like so. And if you click validate, that's all that's required in order to get this, this markup to validate as a valid HTML5 document, okay? Uh, it's pretty crazy. So I guess the moral of the story is that HTML5 is extremely forgiving. In fact, the absence of hard and fast rules or, or syntax styling rules was one of the design goals of HTML5 in the first place, to not break the web. If it already is working in today's web browsers, well, allow it to keep on working. Don't do anything that would break existing web pages if you can uh, if you can help from it. So the practical result is that HTML5 is a very forgiving declarative language. It accepts many different syntax styles. And as an instructor, I would merely say, find a syntax style that works for you and stick with it. Now, what exactly do I mean by the words syntax style? Well, up to this point, I've only used one syntax style, the one that I'm most comfortable with. But ultimately, there are many different ways that you could write HTML5. For example, you can choose to use all cap letters or all lowercase letters whenever you're defining tags. Most people are going to use the lowercase, but I've seen it done both ways. Previous versions of XHTML required to use uh, all uppercase, for example. Then there's the difference of how you set values to the attributes uh, inside of given tags. For example, if I were to, on this div tag, set the class equal to important, I can choose to use double quotes around the word important or choose not to. Uh, I still recommend you use the double quotes around it. Uh, you can choose to use self-enclosing tags or to admit the enclosing tags. So in the case of a cell defined within a table, and we'll talk about that much later, you can choose to define cells uh, just as a, a open close angle bracket TD, or you can include the closing slash TD uh, in order to define one specific cell. It's up to you. Again, most people, I think, if they're coming from a background in writing HTML, are more comfortable with including the enclosing tags. There's also the notion of self-enclosing tags. You can see there's a BR or a line break. Uh, you can either write it without the self-enclosing tag. In other words, at the very end, you see how there's a space slash uh, angle bracket. Uh, that's just another style. You can choose either styles. They both represent the same thing. So it's really up to you. Now, if you go out on the internet, uh, you search around, you're going to find 
uh, heated debates about which style is the best. I'm going to leave it up to you. Pick one and stick with it. Uh, you can choose the one that I use, which is very close to what you might see in previous versions of HTML, just because that's where I'm comfortable, uh, what I'm comfortable with. Okay, so let's shut this down. Let's get back to this document. And at a high level, whenever we were creating the tags around our document, we started off by declaring an HTML tag. It sits almost at the very top, and it's closed at the very bottom. Furthermore, inside of that HTML, or children to that HTML tag, there were two major sections. There was this, this head section, so here's an open head and a closed head, and then there's this body, and then at the very end, or almost at the end, you can see where the body tag is closed, all right? So an HTML tag can include a head section and a body section, all right? Uh, these define the major boundaries of an HTML page. Now you might find it interesting that even these are not required in HTML5. You can still create a valid HTML5 document without these like we saw just a moment ago. Web browsers will actually do you a favor, I guess, and insert the HTML head and body tags in as the browser is going through and parsing your document, no matter whether you declare them or not. And just to demonstrate that, here we have this test.html page, if we were to open it up and look at it in Notepad, you can see that it's very simple. We've just included the word hello world inside the title and I've added a paragraph, hello world in the body. If you were to open it up in Internet Explorer by double clicking it, it's a very simple web page. What's interesting about this is if we were to go to the options over here on the right and select F12 developer tools uh, and then make sure that the HTML tab is selected here in the F12 developer tools. It shows you kind of an outline for the document as it parsed through it, interpreted it, and as it begins to render it. And so this is how Internet Explorer sees our document. Notice that it inserted an HTML, a head, and a body. And we can drill in and see that the head owns a title, and the title owns the word hello world, which we see on our tab. And then the body owns a paragraph, which has the word hello world, like we see right here. And even as we select it, it puts a little line or a little box around it, okay? So the moral of the story here again is that even if you don't insert these yourself, uh, the web browser will typically add them for you. Now, we can just skip the HTML, the head, and the body tags, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we should leave them out. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. I think there's a couple of reasons why I recommend that you explicitly continue to add the HTML, the head, and the body tags even in your HTML5 pages. And the first reason is because we're really in a transitional phase right now. Some people know HTML5, but I'm guessing the majority of people out there aren't familiar with it just yet. So to avoid confusion, keeping these main structural elements in place uh, might actually be good for people who are trying to understand your web page and as they continue to make changes to it or, or work on it in some capacity. Furthermore, there are some helpful attributes that can be added to these tags to perform some helpful tasks. So take, for example, our HTML tag at the very top. I've added an attribute called lang for language, and I've set that equal to the letters en for English. Um, it's there to help search engines or other tools like speech synthesizers, spelling or grammar checkers, or help the browser select the correct font glyph for a given language. Uh, so do you have to use lang equals en? No, not necessarily. However, it's considered by some people to be a best practice. And therefore, to use it, we have to include the HTML tag here as we define our web page. So to summarize, I'd recommend you continue to use HTML head and body tags, even though you and I really know that we don't need to add them. It's still considered a good practice, okay? Okay, so as I said a moment ago, an HTML document has two parts, the head and the body. The head contains information about the body of the document. The body contains the HTML that will be parsed and then ultimately displayed by the web browser. The head can contain a bunch of different things. Now we've seen here uh, it, that it contains the title and it contains a link to our style sheet, uh, but it can also contain a meta tag. Uh, the head is pretty flexible, in fact. It can contain entire style sheet definitions, JavaScript or links to external JavaScript files, and multiple meta tags. So first, let's start with this meta tag at the very top. This particular meta tag deals with the char set. So meta char set equals UTF-8. 
So what are meta tags exactly? Well, the term meta is used often in information technology. It merely means extra information that adds context about something. Okay, in this case, meta tags in HTML add context to the HTML document. So then, what is the char set and why is it set to UTF-8? And what context does that give to our HTML document in this specific case? Well, unfortunately, this is a pretty complicated topic. Uh, again, I'm tempted to go off into a really detailed explanation because I find it fascinating personally. But let me merely direct you to uh, this article for more information. It was written by the owner of a company called Fog Creek Software. Here, let's turn this off. And his name is Joel Spolsky, and he wrote an article called The Absolute Minimum Every Software Developer Absolutely Positively Must Know About Unicode and Char Sets. No excuses. All right, so uh, at any rate, most professional web developers recommend that you include the Char Set Declaration. At a minimum, you should at least understand what it is and why it's important to have it there and what the history of it is. And this is one uh, article that would help you determine that. Um, they also recommend that you make sure that you're saving your documents using UTF-8 and that your server is set up to serve UTF-8. Uh, so as we saw in Notepad already, whenever we're saving as, we want to make sure to set the encoding to UTF-8. As far as the server is concerned, each individual uh, software, whether it's Internet Information Services on Windows-based servers or Apache on uh, Linux-based servers, you just have to make sure that the server is set up to correctly serve UTF-8 documents. Uh, so, ultimately, if your international users ever report seeing these weird characters in their web pages, like uh, black diamonds that have a question mark, a white question mark in the middle, uh, you may have to investigate this further and see what's wrong uh, with either your declaration, the way you've saved your web page, or the way that your server is set up to serve out those types of files, okay? Okay, so what other types of meta tags could be added instead of or in addition to the char set UTA? UTF-8. We'll take a look on screen. I've got a couple of examples here. We have a, a description, a keywords, an author, a revised, and then also a refresh. Uh, and so the, some of these are used purely for SEO purposes. For example, description just allows you to explain the purpose of this given web page. Same thing with keywords. What Keywords are closely aligned uh, to this web page, so that if somebody's searching for it, uh, the given search bot, engine bot, might use this to help determine your ranking. Um, there's also information about who originally authored the web page, the last time the document was modified in any way. And then there's this HTTP equiv equals refresh content equals 60. Basically, this just says that the information on this web page could change potentially often. And so like a news website, for example, and so you should continue, the browser should take that as a cue to refresh the web page automatically every 60 seconds, okay? Uh, so next up, we have the title. We've already talked about this. Uh, the title is simply the text that you want displayed in the web browser's title bar or in the tab, uh, the tab's title area. Okay. Then we have this link, and we've talked about it uh, already in the previous lesson. Uh, it was very fairly simple to understand. Uh, all the attributes of the link. Uh, element are basically rel which is the relationship so what is the relationship of this link document to this document in this case the relationship is that it's a style sheet secondly uh, the href is where you can find this style sheet or this ex external file then there's the type what type should we interpret this file as it's a text slash css file all right and there are some very specific types that are available to you to use here and then finally there's this notion of media equals screen and we'll talk about this much later whenever we're talking about building responsive web pages all right so when you think of the head section think simply additional information about the document even reference inside of the document but not necessarily displayed within the browser itself all right all right, so next up is the body, and you can see that takes up the line share of our file. And I'm tempted to talk about the body tag and what goes on inside of it. However, we're going to be spending really the next seven video lessons on this topic. So let me just talk about the goings on of the body tag at kind of a higher level. Uh, I've used up to this point the term semantics or the term semantic meaning a couple of times so far in this video series. Simply put, when I use the term semantics in relation to HTML5, I'm talking about the implied meaning of a part of the HTML document 
so that a machine, or I suppose even a human reading the code, could interpret the subject matter going on inside of those HTML tags, okay? So the hope is that by being one of the first generation of web developers to mark up our web pages using these rich semantic tags, we're laying the groundwork for developers to add semantically smart software to interpret our web pages. So for example, search engine spiders or screen readers for the visually impaired and maybe other ideas that in 2012 I can't conceive of, but the next generation of developers uh, have this rich foundation to build on top of and be able to extract pieces and parts out of, of the documents that we mark up in this manner. So, for example, by adding a nav tag uh, to our web page, a visually impaired person could theoretically go directly to that part of the web page using a special key on their keyboard and more easily navigate our entire website. Or a search engine bot could skip all of the design chrome around of a web page and go directly to the main articles or sections of the web page more accurately. And these are just some of the examples, again, that we can conceive of today. Over time, it's possible that by embracing the notion of adding semantics or meaning to our web pages, it'll pay off in a big way long term. I'm going to have more to say about this as we continue through the series, but for now, when you hear me say semantic meaning, uh, you'll know everything that I'm implying by that, okay? All right, so let's move on and talk about HTML5 browser support. So HTML5 is relatively new, right? So it stands to reason that older web browsers are unaware of the newer tags that have been added to HTML5. This is why I want to work with Internet Explorer 9.0 or greater in this series of videos. Still, we know that it takes time for people to upgrade their web browsers and some people may never upgrade. So what are you gonna do about that as a web developer? Should you avoid HTML5 altogether and only code HTML 1.0? Well, all I'm gonna say is that in this series, we're gonna talk about uh, HTML5 and CSS3. The number of issues and workarounds that you could employ to try and make HTML5 and CSS3 effects work inside of older browsers could easily make up a series of lessons on its own and I'm going to leave that to somebody who's much more knowledgeable and talented than I am in that area. I would just say that if you're learning HTML today and you don't have a deadline in the near future for a project that uh, that has to work on every single web browser ever created from the beginning of time, then please focus on HTML version 5. The world will catch up with HTML5 eventually, and you'll be positioned well at that point. And frankly, most browsers will ignore tags that they don't recognize. So usually, even if you look at an HTML5 page in an older web browser, it's, it's still going to look probably okay. It may not always look nice, but it'll usually render at least to some extent, okay? If you really, really, really want to know uh, how to make the new HTML5 tags work in older web browsers, then you might want to do a quick search on the internet for a JavaScript file called HTML5 Shim uh, that brings many HTML5 features to older web browsers, okay? Furthermore, you might want to learn more about the notion of progressive enhancements. Uh, it's a style of building websites that begins with keeping older web browsers in mind during web development and then progressively enhancing, but not requiring, new features like those in HTML5 uh, for the page to render properly. So if the user happens to be using a newer web browser, then great. It'll all work uh, and they'll, they're going to be able to take benefit from the enhanced features that you've added in. But if they don't have a newer web browser, then they can still they can still uh, count on the page to render itself and to be useful to them in some way. And Wikipedia is a great starting spot for learning more about the notion of progressive enhancement. Uh, there are other features of HTML5 that we're not going to talk about in this series. So in this series, we're going to be spending most of our time talking about semantic tags. We're going to spend time with the new tags that allow you to create forms to collect information from users and a lot more. Then at the very end of the series, I'm going to briefly talk about the HTML5 Canvas, SVG, or in other words, uh, Scalable Vector Graphics, and then also embedding video uh, using HTML5. And there are some other features that allow developers to do cool stuff, like create offline applications or to save data in a browser-based database and a lot more. However, I'm not going to be covering those in this series. 
Uh, I'm also not going to be covering some CSS level three improvements like CSS three transitions, uh, which allow you to animate portions of your web page. So when you use that in conjunction with the HTML5 canvas and a little bit of JavaScript, you could conceivably create simple games that replace uh, Flash or Silverlight plugin content. CSS3 animation and HTML5 and JavaScript involves advanced techniques and concepts and could easily earn a video series of its own. And these are definitely areas that you can pursue after you complete the series. All right, so HTML5 features are being added all the time with each new release of all the popular web browsers. Uh, if you're curious about an HTML5 feature and you want to check on each browser's current support of that feature, then you can check out this website. I've actually created a bookmark for it here. It's called caniuse.com, and you can search for particular feature of CSS or HTML5, and it'll tell you, for example, uh, what's supported by each given web browser and which version, okay? Now, if you're curious about the single best resource for learning everything there is to know about HTML5, there's a few places you could look. First of all, there's a version of the HTML5 specification uh, that's intended for use by those who are creating web browsers. Uh, you might see the term user agents. That simply means a uh, web browser or some tool on the client that can interpret a web page, okay? Uh, but the version of the specification that I would recommend uh, and refer you to is intended for web authors or, or rather web developers like you and me. And so let's take a look at that. And uh, let's go to, yes. So the URL might change. It's currently, as I record this video, www.w3.org slash tr slash html5 dash author slash, okay? And this is called uh, the HTML5 edition for web authors. I'll be using draft version 29. Uh, however, there might be a newer version by the time that you uh, begin watching this video series. Uh, I anticipate that there are very few differences between what I'm looking at and what you're looking at. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but I'm going to be using this website often, and I'm going to ca be calling your attention to select passages as we go throughout this series. All right, so you might want to bookmark this or somehow uh, get to it very quickly because we're going to be using it often. Okay, so let's go ahead and stop right there. We're off to a great start. Now we're gonna start getting deeper into the details of HTML5 beginning in the next lesson, so we'll see you there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. In this lesson, we're going to take a quick tour of many of the HTML elements that are associated with defining paragraphs and getting semantic meaning to runs of text. So as we're getting started, it's important to remember what I said earlier. Even though your tendency might be to think about the presentation, or in other words, the aesthetics of the web page, you need to think about HTML in terms of semantics. In the case of paragraphs and text, it's the difference of thinking about a particular run of text in a paragraph as being important rather than merely bold or underlined. Do you see the difference there? In one case, I'm thinking about the intent of the run of text. Uh, it's important. Uh, in the other, I'm thinking about its formatting, its presentation. So therein lies the key difference. The same would be true when we use paragraphs in lesson number two. You might recall that I had this running dialogue with myself. Uh, in fact, let's go ahead and take a look. I have it right here. Let's look at the after folder. And I was specifically talking to myself about this section here. We have a paragraph defined here and then another paragraph defined right here where we're including uh, some URLs or IP addresses. And the internal dialogue I had as I was vocalizing it was that I really wanted to put a paragraph kind of to surround all of these things, but yet I needed this vertical spacing so that conventionally it would look correct on a web page. Uh, so the way I solved it was to use a paragraph around all the highlighted text you see there, but then to use line breaks because that's the semantic purpose of the line break. Um, you know, so 
I hope you see the difference there in my way of thinking. I'm looking at the structure of the content merely in terms of vertical spacing versus about thinking about things as complete thoughts. And the complete thought argument won out. And that's why I wrapped the paragraph around the entire complete thought and then used the line breaks uh, conventionally to add some spacing in between, you see? So I'm keeping thematically complete ideas together as one unit. All right, so once you get that distinction down, uh, moving from present merely presentation onto semantics, it'll become easier and easier to understand the purpose of each of the elements that we look at in the specification. So I want you to recall from the previous videos, uh, the last video, that we were looking at the specification here. We're looking at the version of the specification called HTML5 edition for web authors. It's draft 29 created in March 2012. You might have access to a new, newer version of it. That's great. The changes will probably be nominal. You can still follow along with what I'm doing. All right. And I encourage you to do that. But if you scroll down uh, on this document, there will be a table of contents and it's a pretty intense uh, a table of contents with a lot of level of indentation, which is awesome. So the way that I I choose to use this is to in Internet Explorer hit control F on my keyboard to open up the find toolbar and then I can search for example the strong element and that'll lead to the link that I can right click and select open a new tag specifically talking about the strong element as we address that in that section of the video so now I can learn about its definition and see some examples of strong in use. We'll come back to strong in just a little bit. This was just a quick example. That's how I'm going to use it. I'm going to right click on each of these individual items in order to learn more about them. And we'll use that as a style of walking through each of the tags that we're going to cover in the, uh, the next four, five, six lessons. Okay. So as we get started, uh, please note that I'm merely going to show you what I consider to be the most important elements uh, with respect to paragraphs and uh, giving semantic meaning to runs of text. We've already seen some of these in action from lesson number two. Some of them are going to be completely new, but in all cases, I'm going to show you basically just a subset of all the possible elements that you could add when uh, defining paragraphs and text within your HTML5 documents. The key takeaway here is that I'm constantly pointing you towards the specification so that we can use the correct element given its intended semantic purpose inside of our document. All right, that's always the key for us. Okay, so let's start with the basics. Remember, you want to use Control F to, in the find bar. And what we're going to do is look for the word paragraphs. That should lead you to 3.2.5.3 entitled paragraphs. We're going to open that in a new tab. And we just want to understand what is meant when we use the term paragraph. And the definition here is great. That's why I wanted to start here. A paragraph is typically a run of phrase and content that forms a block of text with one or more sentences that discuss a particular topic, as in typography, but can also be used for more general thematic grouping. For instance, an address is also a paragraph, as is a part of a form, a byline, or a stanza in a poem. And we'll see good examples of each of these in just a moment. In fact, let's do this. Let's go let's get rid of that and go back to our table of contents. Control F, the P element, where we'll see some good examples of the paragraph tag in use. All right, so here are some good examples. We can see a traditional paragraph, a couple of sentences kept together like we would read in a book or a magazine article. All right, but then we can also see the use of a paragraph in a uh, the creation of a form which we would use to collect information from a user one paragraph for the name one paragraph for the address all right uh, so we're keeping these collected but thematically separate from each other even though they're, they're two fields in the same form they're still separate fields all right the same is true of a uh, of a poem here we have a stanza of a given poem defined by an opening and closing p paragraph tag and then for each of the individual lines of the poem we're merely using the line break tag which we'll get to in just a little bit so let's hold on to that thought 
Um, and then we have some uses and abuses, some examples, and that's uh, very helpful. But uh, structurally, the paragraph tag represents a complete thought, a grouping of sentences or ideas together, but the specification also uses a typography term, a run of phrasing content. Uh, it also uses the word thematic, indicating that it can be used beyond a simple textual paragraph, as we saw some examples of just a moment. And we'll see another one of an address here in a little bit. Um, so that brings us to the next idea, which is the line break tag or the BR element. All right. And I'm going to right click and select open a new tab. And you can see the BR element represents a line break. And uh, let's see if we need a break in the thought of a given paragraph, and yet the break is merely conventional in nature, then we can use the line break. And a great example of this is, is a address. We already saw that a paragraph can be used to define an address, but here we see an address created. And by convention, we use these BR elements, the line breaks, because that's how we normally visually see an address. Even though it's still one complete thematic thought, we still use these tags to split it up into their own vertical lines because conventionally, that's how we use it. And then below that, uh, it gives us some correct uses and abuses of the BR element. Uh, so just to recap, addresses in poetry represent good uses, while using it to sub uh, separate thematically new thoughts is wrong because this is the domain of the paragraph element. Uh, now, I just finished saying, don't worry about presentation. However, it's hard to ignore the default formatting of the paragraph tag. We saw it just a moment ago when we were looking at the work that we did in lesson number two. The default style sheet uh, will, uh, will separate, will give essentially one uh, return, carriage return, uh, for a line break item and two carriage returns for a paragraph tag. Uh, but that's the in this particular odd instance that's what the br is used for it's used to create a single carriage return essentially uh, to give uh, to give some visual separation so some of these tags kind of cross cross between visual and semantic but that's still the the semantic value of it the purpose of it okay Let's move on. Talk about uh, formatting the text itself, giving semantic meaning to the text. Uh, and so to do that, let's start with the strong element. And I see it right here. So I'm just going to right click it, but you could type in the strong element to the find and then open it in a new tab. And you can see the strong element represents strong importance for its content, uh, like a warning message, for example. Now that's in contrast to, if we take a look, let's see look at the B element and open that up in its own tab. And the B element represents a span of text, text to which attention is being drawn for utilitarian purposes without conveying any extra importance and with no implication of alternate voice or mood such as keywords in a document abstract, product names in a review, actionable words in an interactive text-driven software or an article lead. Now the only reason why I bring this up is because there's some confusion between strong and and the B element uh, with previous versions of HTML. Um, I think there is now a clear semantic difference between the two. With strong, you are indicating that this text has strong importance. With the B element, it's text that you want to draw attention to. Uh, again, in previous versions, it indicated that you wanted the text to be bold, the B tag. However, uh, for that, you should be using strong for that purpose, uh, semantically. Now, the B element merely means that you're pointing out or highlighting those words, but not saying they're important necessarily. And honestly, that's a difficult distinction to make in my opinion, so I would probably not use the B element as often, preferring other tags that are more suitable for this purpose. But uh, I think the good example of this is where they're using a first paragraph or the first part of a paragraph uh, and indicating this as the lead uh, using a class which we'll talk about a little bit later uh, to say that while this text doesn't have importance like a warning message it does serve a purpose within this paragraph in this article it might be you know the byline for the headline okay so let's go ahead and move on and talk about some other markup elements we're going to look at the mark element and right click and open that in a new tab. 
And so the mark element, it indicates a run of text highlighted or marked for reference purposes. So a good example is whenever you're presenting search results uh, on a uh, search results page, you can show the occurrences of the word that was being searched for in line. Uh, and then using uh, cascading style sheets, you can highlight that using a background color of yellow or something to call that out. Or you can mark a run of text that you want to call attention to uh, and will explain or describe later in the section. All right, so that's the purpose of mark. Then there's the M E M element. And this indicates a word or a phrase of emphasis when you read it where changing the emphasis changes the meaning of the sentence. This doesn't necessarily indicate the importance of that phrase or that word, just the way that you say it. You might be thinking this is similar to italicizing. However, there's a slight semantic difference between the M and the I element. So let's open up uh, the I element, which traditionally in the past and previous versions of HTML indicated italicizing. In HTML5, however, the I element represents uh, a term that has a special voice or mood or in some way is offset from the rest of the text. The specification here gives the example of using the I element around uh, a run of text indicating a technical term and it gives another example. Uh, so in this case, look here, here's the technical term. In this other, it gives uh, an example of wrapping it around a dream sequence inside of a short story, okay? And I bring these up, the EM and the I, because the I element was used in previous versions of HTML for presentational purposes to represent italic uh, italicized text. But in HTML5, using the I element merely for italicizing some text is a semantic no-no. Uh, if you want that, uh, to be italicized uh, in the sense that you want it to be read in a different voice or it has some ironic meaning, you would probably choose the EM element instead. All right, so let's go ahead and get rid of these two and move on to the U element. And the U element is used for unarticulated uh, text. It indicates a run of text that you want to call attention to because it's misspelled or it has some strange characters due to its rendering from another language. Uh, this is kind of a tough one to describe. I'm only going to call attention to it because its meaning has changed from previous versions of HTML where it was used for presentational purposes. You used to use the U element if you wanted something underlined. In HTML5, again, that is a semantic no-no. Uh, you would use uh, pure purely cascading style sheets for that purpose. Now you use the U element for unarticulated text, text uh, that um, you can see for marking stress emphasis, the EM element should be used for marking keywords, the B element or the mark element should be used depending on the context. Uh, you can use the site element, but don't use the U element for any of those. Instead, uh, you can use it for uh, text being a proper name in Chinese text, so a Chinese proper name mark, or labeling the text as being misspelled. All right, so that's its true purpose. All right, let's move on from there and talk about the small element. And a lot of what I'm doing, you'll notice here, is I'm trying to correct uh, maybe changes in previous versions of HTML and what that given element means today in HTML5. So if you haven't ever used HTML in the past, maybe this isn't so important to you, but it would definitely uh, be uh, an eye opener if you're hearing this for the first time coming from uh, previous versions of HTML. All right, let's talk about the small element. Think small print, like in those car ad commercials or some text run that's a disclaimer or a caveat or a legal restriction or even a copyright. Uh, just to be clear, just because it uses the, the word small doesn't mean that it has to be presented using a small font. Again, think of the meaning of the term, not the presentation. That presentation is the job of cascading style sheets, all right? So we're going to compare that to, or I'm sorry, just let's move on to the S element, which used to mean strike through, but it has a new 
uh, representation today. It's a run of text that's no longer accurate, but it's left in the document for reference purposes. Now, let me see. Yeah, here's a good example at the bottom of this page. Uh, you'll see that uh, here's an ad, buy our iced tea and lemonade. And then we have an S tag that wraps around this text. Recommended retail price is $3.99 per bottle. That is no longer valid, but it's left in uh, for reference purposes. Now we're selling it for just $2.99 a bottle. All right. And in the past, you would use this to put a line, horizontal line through the text, but that's not necessarily what it's used for. Again, that's thinking presentationally. We want to think semantically that this is information that's no longer valid, but we're leaving in for reference purposes. Okay. Um, so let's contrast this, that, the S element, to the DEL element. And you can see that moves way deeper in our, doc, our outline, our table of contents, to something called edits. And that is the fundamental difference between using S for strike through and DEL for strike through. DEL indicates that the content is marked for remo removal. So the example they provide is to mark a run of text in a to-do list as complete. So you might mark that with del, um, uh, the del element, and then later on style that text with a strike through. So if you've ever used like an online to-do list, uh, like um, uh, 37 signals applications, typically uh, like Backpack or Basecamp, they have to-do lists and when you you put a, a check mark in one of the, the check boxes, it'll put a line through. That would be a good example of the use of the Dell keyword uh, that could then, uh, that presentationally means like you finish that item and then you could use CSS to add a strike through or a horizontal line through that entire line that you've completed. All right. So that's the difference between the S and the Dell elements. Um, and like I said a moment ago, the Dell element really belongs in a separate section of the specification called editing, like we saw back here. Uh, it's used for web applications and content management systems. However, I added here because of its similarity to the S element, like I said a moment ago. All right, moving on, let's talk about the site element, C-I-T-E. And so if you're uh, working on technical papers or a research paper, you might want to use the site element. Uh, let's open that up in a new tab. And so the site element represents the title of a work, uh, a book, a paper, an essay, a poem, a score, and so on. Uh, this can be a work that's being quoted or referenced in detail. Uh, so you use this to identify the title of a work that's being quoted, uh, perhaps in a nearby block quote section. And you can see some examples of this, I believe, here. Well, they don't have a block quote here. But you can see how we're citing a specific uh, books, um, comics, tracks from albums, and so on. Here we are citing a Wikipedia article. All right, so it needs to be used in conjunction with uh, perhaps a block quote. So let's look at that. Uh, let's close that up, and we're going to see a more complete example here. And so the block quote is a grouping element used for quotations from another source. Uh, let's scroll down to find the one that has a good site in it. There we go. Um, so you would then often cite the source inside of the block quote using the cite element that we just looked at a moment ago. The cite can also be used outside of the block quote to call the user's attention to the block quote from, say, a paragraph. Uh, Yeah, here we go. Take a look at this example. Here we're citing Sonnet 130 and then using the block quote element with a cite property or attribute set to where we pulled this from originally, uh, a web page on some fictitious example, all right, where we have then the actual sonnet being quoted in the block quote, all right? And so again, uh, here's another example of a block quote then in the caption of that block quote, we're citing the specific articles uh, and uh, citing the, uh, the magazine or the, the professional publication where it was originally published. All right, so just keep in mind that block quote and cite sometimes work together and are used whenever you need to reference uh, in a more professional context other uh, websites, documents, books, music, whatever the case might be from around the world, okay? 
All right, and then let's move on to the code element. And that kind of takes us in a whole other direction. And you can see the code element represents a fragment of computer code. Uh, and so a good example of this as we scroll down is this section here where we are defining a run of text as code, specifically code, uh, and we're going to use the class element to say that this is Pascal programming language. Now this is optional and there is nothing uh, here that would prevent us from putting any language, even something that's not really a programming language. This is probably more for presentational purposes uh, to format this different than say uh, C Sharp or C++ or Visual Basic code. Okay, uh, But at any rate, we're using this uh, this element, code element, again around a run of text to indicate its semantic meaning that this is code and it should be interpreted as such for presentation purposes. Uh, there's also this pre tag, which we're going to ignore mostly for now. Um, it's used to essentially maintain the indentation levels, for example, the amount of individual spaces, the fact that this is returned because otherwise HTML would would uh, not pay any attention to white space. Uh, carriage returns and things of that nature. Uh, but we're not going to look into that any further in this lesson, at least. Okay. Okay. So let's now take a break and move on from there. And I want to talk about uh, the anchor tag. It's a big deal in web development. And so it's important that you know how it works because it has uh, quite a few options. Uh, you use the anchor tag to create hyperlinks within your document. And we've used hy hyperlinks all along, even in this lesson where we see these are all hyperlinks. As I hover my mouse cursor over, notice that the URLs are changing uh, near the bottom left-hand corner of my web browser, all right? And you know how hyperlinks work. You've used them probably to get to this very uh, video or, or web page where you're, you're watching this video. Uh, there's a whole section of the specification that are devoted to defining anchors or hyperlinks in your document. And I'm going to distill it down to just the basics uh, so that we can move through this material pretty quickly. The good news is that this is a great opportunity for you to get your hands dirty in writing some code. So what you should do at this point is download the code that's associated with this video. Uh, inside of that, that zip file, there will be a folder called Lesson 05. And inside of Lesson 05, there's a before, a work folder, and an after folder. What I want to do is copy everything inside of the before folder. I'm going to paste it in the work folder. And here's where I'm going to do all my work. So I'm going to open up lesson05.html in Notepad using any technique uh, that's uh, familiar. And if I were to just open this page up in Internet Explorer by double clicking, you can see there's just a lot of thick text with some um, H1 tags defining I'm at the top, or I'm sorry, I'm at the bottom, and then anchor tags. And we're going to add our some anchor tags right here. And we'll talk about this thick text a little bit later. But for now, let's do this. I want to start with a really simple scenario and I'm going to add a link to bing.com. Bing and to do that, I'm going to start with just creating a paragraph. And inside of that, I'm going to define an anchor tag, an opening and closing anchor tag. And inside of that, I'm going to give a href, at, href attribute I'm going to set it equal to the URL of www.bing.com. And then between the opening and closing uh, anchor tag, I will insert any text that I want the user to be able to click on, in this case, to Bing. And so let's save this and then open it up in Internet Explorer. And you can see I get a hyperlink that says to Bing beneath my anchor tag uh, H1 here at the very top and my thick text below it. When I click on that, it opens up bing.com in my web browser. Awesome. All right, so what I've done here is I've defined what's called an absolute URL where I'm including the full uh, HTTP colon slash slash. I'm also including all the, uh, the first level, second level, and third level domain name, all right? Uh, there's also the idea of a relative URL. So in this case, let's create a reference to another page. In fact, this page will be just another.html. 
which is akin, I guess you would say, it is a sibling to the lesson05.html page inside of the same folder. And so to create this relative URL, I'm gonna start with the opening and closing anchor tag, and then href equals, and then I'm merely gonna use the name another.html. And then here inside of, or between the opening and closing anchor tag, I'll just type in another, to another HTML page, like so. Save this. Now let's uh, go back and refresh our page. You can see we get this link to another HTML page. When I click on that, it opens up the another.html page. It's in the same folder as my lesson05.html page. And I merely added, uh, before you even, uh, you know, before I recorded this video, I created that page, added the link back to this lesson05.html page. So we're able to return here using a return hyperlink. Great. Uh, there's a bit more to this story. If you take a look at uh, this folder where I'm doing all my work, the lesson05.html page that I'm currently typing in, we've already looked at another.html. There's also a subfolder called subfolder and inside of the subfolder there's a subfolder.html page so what if i wanted to create a relative hyperlink from this page to the page that's inside of my subfolder well to do that let's go ahead and add another paragraph tag and then inside that a href equals and here i'm just going to type in the word subfolder since that's the name of my subfolder slash then the name of the file that i want to reference subfolder HTML. And here I'm going to type to the subfolder HTML page. And let's save that. And let's refresh this page. And then now let's click on our new hyperlink. And it takes us to, you'll notice, lesson05 slash work slash subfolder slash subfolder.html. Awesome. Now, what if I wanted to return back from this page to the parent directory? How would I go about doing that? We well, can see I've already created that hyperlink and it brings us back. Let's take a look at the code that I wrote to make this happen. Let's open this with Notepad. And you can see that in this case, I use this special notation, dot, dot, slash, which means go to the parent directory, at which point you'll find a file named lesson05.html. So whenever you see dot dot and slash, it means go to the parent directory to find the given resource, in this case, the HTML page. All right. Um, and we're going to come back to this notion in just a little bit. We'll talk about relative URLs and give a quick overview before we finish up. Um, but one thing I wanted to show you is that up to this point in our page, every time I click on the to Bing hyperlink, it opens the hyperlink in the same tab in the same uh, instance of Internet Explorer. But what if I wanted to open this up either in a new tab or in a whole new window? Well, I can accomplish that by adding an additional attribute called target. And there are a number of different target values that I could put here. The one I'm going to use, though, is blank, which means open up in a blank window, essentially. All right. So some of the other ones have things to do with frames, and we're not going to talk about frames in a series of videos. Just just note that there are some other uh, options here besides blank. Notice the the underscore before the word blank. Okay, make sure you have that. That's important. Let me refresh my web page and then click the to Bing link. And now notice that it opens up a second instance of Internet Explorer. Now that's just how I have my copy of Internet Explorer. Um, uh, configured. You can configure it to open uh, new uh, URLs in new tabs in your first instance of Internet Explorer if you wish and you would just go through uh, I'm not sure exactly where to do that. I think it's somewhere in Internet Options. Uh, you can configure that. Um, I guess it's right here under tabs probably. All right, But I'm not going to take the time to look through that. Alright, but that's how you would open up and the benefit of that is that it keeps your user on your page while opening up your references to other web pages that you might have if that's something that you want to enable. 
All right, finally what we want to do is talk about named anchors, and that's really the purpose of having all this text. I needed a lot of thick text so that I can create essentially a bookmark or I can push you deeper down into the web page using a named anchor. So let's go ahead and uh, create a paragraph. Inside the paragraph, create an anchor tag. And inside the anchor tag, I'm going to set the href equal to, and I'm going to use a pound symbol, and then the word bottom, which will be the name of the anchor I'm creating. And I'm just going to use this text to click on to bottom. Now what I want to do is scroll to the very bottom of this document, and where it says I'm at the bottom, I'm going to put another anchor. This time, I'm not going to use an href attribute. Instead, I'm going to use the name attribute. And I'm going to make sure it matches what I formerly used prior to that in the href, the pound bottom. Now I'm just going to use the word bottom with no pound symbol. So name equals bottom. And let's save this. And then let's open up an Explorer. Let's refresh this page. I have my two bottom link. And when I click it, notice it pushes me all the way deep down to the very bottom of the web page. So you see a lot of times when you have a long article, there might be a Go to the top of the web page uh, hyperlink in the lower in the right hand corner in which case it'll take you all the way to the top you can enable that type of uh, navigation we've been using this sort of navigation all along inside of the uh, 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 the table of contents so for example here i want to get to character encodings notice the url in the very bottom left hand corner there's an infrastructure.html pound character encodings so that when i open this in a new tab It'll bring us not only to the infrastructure.html page, but then it'll push us deep down into that web page to the named anchor character encodings to this so that we can get specifically to this part of the page. All right. One other thing before we conclude here, let me get back and open up our lesson05.html page that we've been working on. Notice that once you've visited a hyperlink, the default style that's applied to those hyperlinks changes the color to purple instead of blue by default. You'll have control over this in cascading style sheets. However, if you want to reset this Internet Explorer, you'd merely go to um, the tools, Internet options. You would go to browsing history and uh, click the delete button and make sure that you are deleting the history and then click delete and you'll get a little message internet explorer has finished deleting the browsing history let's go ahead and click ok and then close down the browser so that the next time i open it up you can see it's reset which links i've already clicked through and which ones i haven't again we're, we can control the colors of the different states of a hyperlink using cascading style sheets, and we'll talk about that a little bit later in this series. All right. Okay, so when we refer to external resources in an anchor element or an image element, we need to be aware of path syntax. And we've already looked at this a little bit whenever we were looking at the subfolder a little bit ago. We've already talked about the differences between absolute and relative URLs. So this really is more about referencing relative URLs because absolute URLs, we would just put the full domain name and all the folders until we get to the actual resource, whether that's a GIF file, an HTML page, or whatever the case might be. So if we wanted to reference something else in our href, for example, of our anchor tag, we would use, uh, and, and that resource was in the same directory as our web page, we can merely reference it like so, a.gif. If that file was in a parent directory, we could use the dot dot slash notation that we talked about just a few moments ago. If uh, the given resource is in a subdirectory uh, called images, then we would use uh, images slash a dot gif. And we saw this whenever we were referencing the subfolder where we use subfolder slash subfolder dot html. Okay. Uh, but what if the uh, the images folder was, I guess, at the same level, a sibling to the current folder that we're in? So then first we need to travel to the parent directory, then travel to its subdirectory called images to find the a.gif. So that's what's represented in that dot dot slash images slash a.gif. And then finally, what if the images folder was deeply nested uh, and so we have to go to the parent of the parent folder uh, and then find the images subfolder uh, where our images are stored. In that case, we could do dot dot slash dot dot slash images slash a dot jeff.
okay? All right, so admittedly, this can get quite convoluted. So why not just use an absolute URL reference every single time instead of a relative URL uh, and have to contend with all these uh, navigating back and forth through the directory structure like we've been doing. Well, if the website should ever move, you'd simply need to keep the relative directory structure the same at the new server or location uh, relative to the directory structure and the same references are still valid in that case. Uh, you might think you might never need that, but if you're developing a website locally and then you move it to a server at some point, you'll quickly see the value of using relative paths over fixed or absolute paths. All right. Also, when it comes to the URL itself, some characters have special meaning or must be encoded in some way so that they're properly routed to the correct resource on the web server. This process is called URL encoding. The best and the most frequent example that you're going to see is whenever somebody has a space in a file name used in a URL. You have to convert that space character to uh, one of two things, either a plus symbol or the, uh, the percentage to zero uh, ASCII code. The percentage is an escape sequence to indicate that it's an ASCII value and then the two digits that follow are hexadecimal values that indicate what kind of ASCII character. In this case we're representing a space character with the two zero. Now there are dozens and dozens that you can find uh, in any reference for URL encodings but only a handful are really used frequently. So what I'd encourage you to do is just search for the term URL encoding in Bing.com or check out the Wikipedia article that you see here on the screen for more information about URL encodings. Also, you've already seen the pound symbol used in a URL to indicate an anchor, a named anchor, deep into the body of a web page. Throughout this series, I've pointed you to specific sections on various pages in the HTML specification using the pound symbol. So, I might give you a URL like this, and I'm just going to paste it in to uh, the location bar in Internet Explorer. It includes not only the HTML file, but then also a pound symbol. And again, this allows me to deep link inside of uh, the web page um, to the specific, uh, the specific uh, element or item that I want to call your attention to. So, um, but there's also a way to send name value pairs in the URL, uh, and that's called a query string. You're going to learn more about query strings whenever you learn ASP.NET as a means of maintaining state or passing values between two web pages. So you're going to see this type of URL often. Take a look at the URL on screen. Uh, www.weber.com slash default.aspx. Then there's a question mark and then a val1 equal hello world, hello, and then an ampersand and a val2 equals world. So let me explain what each of these things are doing. Uh, you can pretty much, for the most part, ignore everything up to the question mark with regards to query strings. It's everything after the question mark that is a query string. The question mark clues you into the fact that we're querying, and so everything after that is a query string. And so we have a set of a series of name value pairs. The name of an attribute or property is, in this case, val1, and we set it equal to some value, hello. And then to designate that we need a second set of name value pairs, we use an ampersand symbol. And then val2 is the name of the second uh, attribute that we have set a value to, and then equal sign to the value of world. All right. So why you might ever want to do that, again, once you get into uh, more programming topics where you need to pass values from one web page to another, and it might be information that would be then used to look up something in a database. You'll see the value of that. But for now, just note that everything after the question mark is considered a query string. And you'll see those URLs often whenever you're looking throughout the internet. Okay? So that's all I really have to say about URLs and hyperlinks and anchors and uh, the difference between relative and absolute URLs and so on. But this topic will come up again briefly whenever we talk about the source attribute of the image element a little bit later in this series of videos. All right, so the final element that I want to talk about is the span. So let me get back to our table of contents here. And then I'm going to hit Control F on my keyboard and type in the span element. And right click and select Open in New Tab. So it's intended to be used generically, specifying a run of text 
that really doesn't fit into any of the other elements that we've already mentioned. Now, the truth be told, in previous versions of HTML, you used the span element as a hook into CSS for some inline text that you wanted to format in some special way. Say, for example, you wanted some text to be red. You might wrap it with a span tag and then give it a special class or ID name uh, in order to pluck it out and identify that little chunk of text to have a red font. Uh, that's still allowed, but you're strongly encouraged to use one of the other elements first so that the document is marked up semantically, right? Uh, so again, if you just use span elements all over the place, you use the rich semantic markup of your document that was intended with HTML5. And so you can see some uh, uses of the span tag uh, throughout the this document and it uses kind of uh, a, a code example and it's identifying some items as keywords uh, for the C programming language some items as um, uh, I guess identifiers like J and identifiers like I underscore T3 and so on okay so that would be the use of the span in this case where there's no other semantic uh, markup element that would allow you to identify given elements of this code example uh, some as variables some as keywords and so on and you could mark it up and use text coloring appropriately in that case all right now using the class attribute like they use here in the spec uh, as they demonstrate here in the specification uh, it does provide you some level of meaning to your span tags however since you're the one making up the values in the class attribute other applications wouldn't be able to interpret the cl that class attributes value uh, the way that they would be able to interpret HTML5 markup that's that's defined in the specification uh, the class attribute is useful for cascading style sheets, but not a screen reader, for example. The screen reader doesn't know what you mean by, uh, by ident or uh, keyword and so forth. Okay, But if you see other people's code, especially code that's written to target versions prior to HTML5, you'll see this used quite a bit, uh, and as well as its sectioning equivalent, the div tag. And we'll have more to say about the div tag in the next lesson. Okay, finally, before we wrap up this lesson, I want to talk about the uh, attributes that can be added to each HTML5 element. And there are a few global attributes that apply to many elements. Here in this case, I have a span tag on screen, you can see. And there is, first of all, a class attribute equal to storyline, and then an ID equal to first story header. In this case, I have two attributes, a class attribute and an ID attribute. Um, uh, now, I've, I've used a span tag, but I could have used any element here. These, are, What I'm about to show you are global attributes. They can be used on any attribute defined in HTML5. Uh, I've added a class and an ID. An ID is typically used as a, a unique identifier that I can add to each element if I so desire. The ID attribute is typically used for client-side scripting, uh, for example, whenever I use JavaScript so that I can access one item programmatically. It can also be used uh, with cascading style sheets by referencing just the ID. So the ID attribute is completely optional, but if you do choose to use it, each ID must be unique on a given page. Similar to the ID is the name attribute, which is typically used on the server side to process form data. Uh, I'm going to discuss this a little bit uh, in more detail when we get to the lesson on creating forms. It's similar in purpose, but typically it's utilized by our server side code logic to retrieve a user submitted value. Let's just table that discussion for right now. now let's talk about global attributes. Uh, and to do that, let's be in our table of contents, let's type in global attributes because if you look at this particular web page inside the specification it'll give you a list of global attributes that can be applied to virtually uh, any HTML element as well as others that have some specific uses uh, and intent for uh, handling events but let's just focus on these at the very top here um, the class attribute as you can see, it's one of the global attributes that are available. It's a classification of a given element. You can invent as many class values as you wish, and they're typically used by cascading style sheets as a hook for styling the elements on your web pages. Other software could utilize the class attribute for other purposes. Uh, but 
it's a good idea to keep class names semantically correct as well. So you might be tempted to create a class called red text and then create cascading style sheet styles that set the appearance of the font to be red. However, a better idea might be to call it something like important message, then style it with a red font if you wish. Uh, we'll talk about CSS later and we'll make sure to re-emphasize this idea. And there are other attributes like style and title that are global in nature and then there's dozens of attributes that are uh, specific to different types of HTML5 elements and we'll cover these as needed in the rest of our lessons. Okay, so let's go ahead and wrap this up. As you probably noticed, many of the links that I used in this lesson were from this section 4.6 in our table of contents, this text level semantics. We looked at the anchor and the M and the strong and the small and the S and the site, but we didn't look at things like the Q and the DFN and the ABR and the time and the, the VAR and the SAMP and so on. All right, so there's still a lot of work for you to do on your own. Go through each one of these and make sure you understand or at least read through uh, what the semantic value is for for these so when you face a situation where you need to add some semantic markup inside of your paragraphs you can give them the rich meaning that they deserve uh, with HTML5 okay so in the next lesson we're gonna look at structural semantics it's extremely important make sure you watch the next video as well we'll see you there thank you Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. In this lesson, we're continuing our look at the various elements available in HTML5. In this lesson, we're going to focus on the heading content and sectioning content. A combination of these will provide structure to our web pages, or rather, they're ways of grouping content on our web page in a semantic manner. The previous lesson merely dealt with paragraphs and runs of text. However, there are larger structural elements uh, in a typical web page that define sections like the header, the navigation area, the footer, and of course, the main area. Uh, you might be working through this and asking yourself, do I really need these? Do I really need to know all these HTML5 uh, structural elements? And the truth is that we can create web pages without any of these structural elements uh, that we're gonna discuss in this lesson. However, a real HTML5 page will contain these because of the, uh, the reasons that I mentioned a little bit earlier and in previous videos, leaving them out means that our page is void of semantic structural meaning. These are important as far as HTML5 is concerned, so let's go ahead and dive into them. And we're going to start with heading content, specifically look at H1, H2, H3, and so on. Uh, so you can see I'm already starting here on the specification page. If you haven't already, please navigate to it and create a bookmark because we're going to keep coming back to this. And you'll recall from previous videos the technique we use is to hit Control F, on our keyboard to bring up the find uh, uh, the find toolbar and here I'm going to type in the h1 comma and that will get us close enough to this title called the h1 h2 h3 h4 h5 and h6 elements I'm going to right click and select open in new tab and uh, these heading elements uh, define the headers of the various sections in our documents. So here we have a series of ranks. H1 is the highest rank and H6 would be the lowest rank. So uh, for example, H1 would be the subject of a section. H2 would be subsections that belong to the H1 session and so on. So you can think of a hierarchy or kind of an outline where you have up to six levels of hierarchy or indentation or whatever, what have you, okay? Actually, there's a way to get more than six levels with sectioning, but that's kind of an advanced concept and I don't want to talk about it right now. Uh, so these are the ways that you describe the various sections that we're going to define using sectioning content elements in just a bit. Uh, so I created a really quick example of this. Make sure you download the code from wherever you are uh, currently watching this video or wherever you originally downloaded this video. There should be a zip file that has a folder called Lesson06. If you open it up, there's just one file in it. And if you double click it, you can see an example of using an H1, H2, H3, H4, H5, and H6. Uh, we can look at the source um, for this file. And there's really nothing up my sleeve here. It's fairly simple and straightforward. I think it's interesting to note that by default, there's a style sheet applied that makes the H1 a very large font and the H6 
a very small font and each of them in between are various degrees okay but again you style this using cascading style sheets you typically never just adopt the uh, the default style sheet if you're going for a highly stylized web design all right but at any rate uh, semantically what we're indicating here is a number of ranks and a hierarchy for our content uh, okay so let me go ahead and close that down and get back into our web browser so let's talk about sectioning content elements uh, we use these in lesson number two and they're tags like the header so let me start off by doing this let's the header element and I'm just gonna right click and open that in a new tab and we're gonna type in the footer element and I'll right click and open that in a new tab and then also the nav element and open that in a new tab all right all right so before I discuss which each what each of these uh, are and why they're important we need to know that they can be added in any order within our document uh, in fact a footer can be can appear before the header because we're interested in the semantics not necessarily the order of how these elements appear visually on the web page if we take a look at the header element here on our page we can see that the header element represents a group of introductory or navigational aids uh, so we used it in our example in lesson number two as the very topmost section of the web page but it could be used in other sections on the page if we wanted to indicate that it will contain important information for that given section so you might think of an example of a blog uh, you might have a web page that has uh, multiple blog posts on it uh, it might contain uh, each of those individual blog posts are contained in a section and uh, each individual blog post might have a title and author how many likes <laughs> it got buttons to various social networks and so on so you might in that case have a couple of different headers one header for each of the blog uh, entries on that given page and then another header uh, section at the very top of the web page itself uh, similarly we can look at the footer element and the footer element represents a footer for its nearest ancestor sectioning content or sectioning root element a footer typically contains information about its section such as who wrote it the links related uh, to related documents copyright data and the like so in our example in lesson two we used it at the very bottom of the web page but here again going back to that blog example I spoke about just a few moments ago you might have several blog posts on a single page and uh, you might have uh, for each of the individual blog post sections, you might have a little footer with the date that it was written, the author, the pingback information, the ability to add comments, and so on. And then there's the nav element. And you can see it describes the nav element as uh, represents a section of the page that links to other pages or departs within the page, a section with navigation links. So we might typically think of the navigation in terms of a menu at the very top of each page of a website and possibly at the very bottom of every page as well. However, if you had links on the page that push the user deeper into the web page, kind of like we have here, uh, with uh, using named anchors and so forth as a form of bookmarks or any sub navigation on the page you would use a nav tag to indicate that regardless of where it appears on the given page or whether it's in a header or footer or not so uh, we said that these tags the header the footer the nav can appear in any order it's relative to their meaning within the given document furthermore they can appear multiple times again if it makes sense semantically to do so so for example a page that lists multiple blog posts is a good example of that where we were able to use or at least conceive of how we would use the header the footer and the nav multiple times on a single web page but let's not worry about that too much if we keep our pages simple this really won't be an issue at least not right away so but here we can begin to see the value of defining our markup in terms of semantics so that a screen reader can skip the header, the footer, and the navigation areas and go directly to the main sections like the articles on a given web page. So next up, let me shut all these down. Let's talk about the uh, article element. And let's talk about uh, the section element. All right, so let's start with the article element. Uh, 
Okay, so when we're thinking about article, we're not simply thinking about like a newspaper article. Instead, we're thinking about something that's a complete unit, a complete idea, uh, something that can be syndicatable. And what do I mean by that? Uh, well, take for example, on an e-commerce website, you might have a number of products in a product catalog, uh, a book, a shirt, a dishwasher, whatever the case might be. Uh, each of those products might have a title, a description, uh, an image, uh, a... Um, a price and so on, right? And so if you publish these correctly in a way that's consumable by other websites, they can be uh, syndicated on those websites. So for example, a search engine or another website that's like an, has an affiliate relationship with your website could take the entire definition that you created uh, inside of the article designation, inside of the article specification, and then include it on their own website so that your products come up as uh, items in the search engine or could be included uh, as in a comparison website. And so this gives a, a company another avenue through which to sell their products by merely structuring the content for each of their products uh, using articles and making them syndicatable, okay? Um, the same could be said of a blog post for that matter or a news article or sports scores or anything that's a complete thought should be marked as an article so that it can be potentially syndicated by others if that is indeed your ultimate intent. Um, now, the sectioning element, as we see here, there we go, the section element uh, is has a different intent. You can see that the section element represents a generic section of a document or application. A section in this context is a thematic grouping of content typically with a heading. All right, so it is generic in nature, but it generally represents smaller pieces of a larger component. So for example, while an article might be a big picture idea or thought, uh, a series of sections could define individual parts of the article. Now, of course, this is relative. Conversely, a section could contain articles, if that semantically makes sense. Uh, sections can contain other sections. So just like I said about the header, the footer, and the nav appearing multiple times in a document, the same is true with a article and a section. And this might sound crazy, but a section can contain articles that can contain sections, okay? And so at this point, I created a couple little graphics to help uh, smooth this over. Um, this first image that you see on screen, it uh, closely resembles the layout for the uh, the project that we worked on in lesson 02 where we have a section with a couple of articles inside of it at the very top and bottom we have a header and footer each have a nav section uh, inside of it okay so that's a, a pretty straightforward and we see how uh, we have a section that contains articles let's look at an alternate uh, version of this in a second image here our header and footer look exactly the same, but inside of our section in the main area, we have an article and then a second article that has some subsections defined inside of it. So in this case, we have a section that has an article that contains two sections, okay? And then let's look at a third example here where we have a header and a footer by themselves and then a nav section that's not part of the header or the footer. Uh, inside of the uh, main area it's called the article and the article has a header and a footer with two subsections inside of it and there are literally uh, probably no end to the combinations that we come up with these are just some ideas to kind of illustrate the things that we've been talking about so the real question at this point is what is all this accomplishing well, it allows the scenario where each article is syndicated to multiple websites and you want to retain the semantic meaning of the headings and the paragraphs and so on. Now, the site compiling the articles might define a different styling, but it can use uh, the entire section in its entirety, okay? Uh, a lot of time is spent on uh, in the specification explaining some of these scenarios and they're a bit on the advanced uh, advanced side and advanced use cases but all I'll say about it for now is that each section that you define essentially restarts the hierarchy of headings so that you can have more than six just six headers so for a full understanding of of uh, the notion of outlines and how the uh, the sections reset the, the, the styles associated with the various headings. Take a look in our, uh, in our document here at creating an outline. 
and spend some time reading this over. Uh, you never see outlines, but it's just how web browsers are supposed to interpret the scenarios that I just described. And this might help you come to a better understanding of the relationship between sections and headings if you need those for a complex page structure. Okay, so moving on, let's take a look at the aside element. And this is another structural tag that has meaning. Uh, it's used to define any part of a document that doesn't belong directly in the paragraphs, but supplies some additional information. So it could be uh, skipped over. It might define a marketing message, a pull quote, a did you know section like some books have or what have you. And if you take a look at um, this example, you can see the use of the aside for a pull quote. Here we have a paragraph of text and another paragraph of text. And in the middle of it, we have an aside defined. And uh, in this case, the aside is merely uh, used to draw the, the reader's attention deeper into the article, so to provide some visual interest uh, to the article and highlight the most important quotes from the article. All right? All right, so let's move on to the div element. And I mentioned the div element in the previous lesson, saying that it was the sectioning equivalent uh, of the span element in so much that it has no inherent semantic meaning. So take a look at how it describes this. The div element has no special meaning at all. It represents its children. Uh, it can be used with the class, lang, and title attributes to mark up semantics common to a group of consecutive elements. Authors are strongly encouraged to view the div element as an element of last resort. For when no other element is suitable, use of more appropriate elements instead of the div element leads to better accessibility for readers and easier maintainability for authors. All right, so we're saying this section of content defined inside of a div tag belongs together, but it really doesn't fall into any of the other semantic containers that we might have available to us in HTML5. Now, that should be rare. However, the div tag was abused in previous versions of HTML. In fact, somebody coined the phrase divitis for web pages that have dozens of div, div tags defined. The reason people use so many div tags was for page layout. Uh, the div provided a way to get some advanced layouts without having to resort to tables for page layout, which is another semantic no-no. However, in doing so, they merely replaced one bad habit with another. So should you use the div element in HTML5? Well, the specification, as we just read, says that it's the section and container of last resort. But practically speaking, I expect we're still going to see a lot of the div tag because even in the, the most careful designs, there will always be a trade-off between semantic purity and aesthetics. In other words, to achieve a beautiful page design with drop shadows and rounded corners, dramatic layouts with other neat features, the div tag will be employed as a box around which styling can be applied. So we're going to talk about this more when we get into CSS, but if you look at most web pages on the internet, each will contain many, many div tags, uh, typically used for styling purposes. So that's kind of the practical nature of web development. Everybody agrees that something is a good idea or a bad idea, uh, a bad idea because it doesn't adhere to a certain ideal, but to get the desired layout, compromises are sometimes made, okay? All right, so finally, there's an element related to our heading content, but wasn't included as part of the heading or section and content model, and that is the H group. Let's take a look at that. So the H group or the heading group element represents the heading of a section. The element is used to group a set of H1 through H6 elements when the heading has multiple levels such as subheadings, alternate titles, or taglines. Um, so the heading group is a new tag that's meant to treat multiple heading tags as a single unit. Sometimes the H1 tag is used for a company name to be displayed besides the logo, and then the H2 is used or intended to be used as the byline or some type of phrase to describe what the company does. Uh, in these cases, you can group them all together to be represented as a single entity, not as a hierarchical elements the way that you normally use the H1 and the H2 and so on. And they have a good example of this. You can see uh, here we have an H group where we have a um, uh, perhaps an article or a book, and then so the book's official title, and then a uh, a byline or a secondary title 
uh, as you can see it described as here, okay? Okay, so I think I covered most of the elements used for sectioning and heading purposes. I think conceptually the hard part is over. We'll merely add to the elements that we're going to cover for adding things like images and lists and tables and forms and so on. Uh, but I want to emphasize that what I talked about in the last two lessons, as well as this lesson, may seem like pretty heady stuff, but honestly, I wouldn't sweat it a whole lot. Uh, if you make a mistake and you use the wrong tag, chances are your pages are still going to look correct on most web browsers. The worst that can happen is that semantically, your page loses a little bit of value, a little bit of semantic meaning. We could have just ignored lessons five and six for the most part, but I think you miss the heart of HTML5 if you skip these, these new tags that have been added. You might ask, uh, well, what's the purpose for all these tags? Well, hopefully we've been answering what the purpose for all these tags is uh, all along so that you get a, a sense, a strong sense of meaning and semantics whenever you're thinking of using HTML5. Okay, so like I said, I think the hard part's over. It's all downhill from here, just learning new tags. But hopefully, firmly ensconced in your mind is that difference between the semantic meaning and uh, its representation or its aesthetic uh, representation within the web browser. Once you get past that hurdle, it's all pretty easy. Okay, so we're going to continue on the next lesson. We'll see you there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. In this lesson, we're going to talk about adding images and figures to our HTML5 documents. So let's go ahead and start with the image or IMG element. And just to remind you, we're looking, looking at a version of the specification called HTML5 Edition for Web Authors. And I'm just going to scroll down to remind us that we're searching on the table of contents. I'm going to hit Control F on my keyboard to bring up the Find toolbar. I'm going to type in the IMG, and that'll bring us to a section of the table of contents specifically related to the image. Notice that unlike many of the elements that we've looked at up to this point, there's a lot to the image as we can see clearly from the uh, the amount of the indentation level, the amount of content uh, that is uh, contained inside of the IMG element. But let's go ahead and just open it up in a new tab. Uh, it You can see there are a number of attributes that are specific to the IMG control like the alt and the source. And we'll talk about those in just a moment. Um, in its basic form, you simply need uh, the following to define an image. Uh, so the IMG source attribute equals and then uh, the alt attribute equals. So it simply has two requirements, a valid source attribute that points to an image file using a URL and then an alt attribute which describes the image for those who can't process image or those who have uh, image loading disabled. So here again, a nod to screen reader software for those who have limited or no vision capabilities. The alt value would be read aloud in these cases describing the content of the image to that person uh, that's uh, visually impaired. There are other optional attributes allowed in HTML5, including a width and a height, for example, allowing you to specify the images width and height in pixels. Now, here's where the presentation overlaps with semantic meaning. I would recommend that you handle the sizing of your images purely in CSS. However, you're going to see plenty of people defining image elements with width and height and certainly it is allowed. Sometimes if the image can't be loaded for some reason, an empty placeholder will be represented by um, kind of a, uh, a, a large box with a, a little icon in the upper left hand corner with a little X through it. And uh, if you have the width and the height, then it will use that uh, to size that empty box appropriately uh, so there is a pragmatic rationale to their existence because it might help with the formatting of the rest of the page if that image, if you're relying on the size of that image to help format uh, the rest of the page relative to that image. Um, but I still think despite that advantage you should opt to keep things semantically clean and keep all your presentation information including the size of the images in your cascading style sheets okay and we'll show how to do that much later now with regard to the source attribute you can set it to any valid URL that resolves to an image file and the same rules that we talked about in lesson 5 about URLs apply here as well uh, so I'm not going to take the time to reiterate them 
It's common to keep all images in a separate folder for easy management, something like slash images or slash creative. Just keep in mind then that most likely you'll see something like this whenever you're looking at other people's source code. So src attribute equals images slash my.gif or source equals uh, dot dot slash. Remember that means go to the parent directory and then the images directory my.gif, okay? Now moving on, in some cases we want to use an image in an academic context where it's important to annotate the source or provide a caption and then reference the specific image or textual resource like a table or a quote in a paragraph. In those cases you can use uh, the figure. So let's go ahead and look at the figure element and open that up. And since I'm right here, I'm going to go ahead and open up the fig caption as well, since we'll talk about that in just a moment. So if you take a look at, first of all, uh, you can see the figure element represents some flow content optionally with a caption that's self-contained. It's typically referenced as a single unit from the main flow of the document. Uh, it can be used to annotate illustrations, diagrams, photos, code listings, and so on that are referred to from the main content of the document, but that could, without affecting the flow of the content, be moved away from the primary content. Uh, for example, to the side of the page, to dedicated pages, or to an index. All right, and so I think um, a good example of that, I think they have one here. Okay, so you can see on screen that I have a, uh, uh, a snippet out of an HTML page with uh, image source equals welcome.jpg and then I create a fig caption uh, and we'll talk about that in just a moment but the figure is the collection of the image itself as well as a caption uh, in the fig caption so let's go ahead and take a look at that we already had the web page open you can see the fig caption represents a caption or legend for the rest of the contents of the fig caption elements parent figure element so basically just a caption or a legend for the contents inside or in the remaining portion of the figure that's apparent to the fig caption. All right, in this case, we just happen to have something called a caption for the image. And then I have uh, some small copyright information as well. So a figure is used to include photos, illustrations, code diagrams, listings, and so on without affecting the flow of the document. It can be moved to its own web page or it can be moved away from the place where it's referenced. Um, and so if you take a look on this page, uh, you can see in this example uh, uh, a, another uh, example of where it's used with code. Here we have a figure that includes um, code and we have a caption that calls it listing for the primary code interface API declaration alright so that's a an interesting way to use it and the fig caption element represents a caption or a legend for the rest of the contents inside the figure just like we see here okay so besides working with simple images we also talked about figures and captions in this lesson uh, let's keep moving forward this is a very simple concept let's not spend more time on it than we need to in the next lesson we're gonna work with uh, lists and other groupings of content we'll see you there thank you Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. In this lesson, we're going to talk about grouping content together. We'll start by talking about lists, which are simply groupings of individual list items. And then we're going to broaden the scope and look at grouping the way that the HTML5 specification understands grouping. And we're going to look at all sorts of groupings. Uh, some we've already looked at, just didn't realize that we we're actually looking at a group. And then others that will be completely new to us. All right, so let's start with talking about lists of things. And there's three different types of lists in HTML5. HTML5. There is the unordered list, the ordered list, and then the definition list. So we always need to start with the specification to see what it says about the semantic meaning of these tags. So uh, again, I encourage you to go to the address. You should have already have this bookmarked, uh, but we're looking at the version of the specification called HTML5 edition for web authors. We're going to scroll down and search through the table of contents by hitting control F on the keyboard. We're going to start by looking for the UL element, and that'll get us close to not only the UL element, but also the OL element and the LI element. 
And so let's start with the unordered list or the UL element. It represents a list of items where the order of the items is not important. That is, we're changing the order would not materially change the meaning of the document. And they have some good examples below. Notice this first one, I've lived in the following countries. And then we have a UL and a number of individual list items. Now one little stylistic thing I want to point out here, notice that they don't use the enclosing uh, slash li element. Uh, the, again, not required in HTML5 for certain items like the list item. Uh, I still feel like it's good practice, so I'm going to encourage that when you're writing code, but you don't have to. Uh, but changing this list of items does not materially change the meaning of the list. You still have lived in all these countries, regardless of whether you list Switzerland uh, before Norway or Norway before Switzerland, okay? So that's essentially what they mean by that. Compare that to the OL, the ordered list, where items have been intentionally ordered such that changing the order would change the meaning of the document. All right, and so a good example here would be, uh, I've lived in the following countries given in the order of when I lived, uh, first lived there. So now we have imposed on this list uh, a meaning to each of the individual items. We're changing the, uh, the order of the items would change the meaning of the list. Uh, and so you can see that in this case, Switzerland comes before UK, before US, before Norway, because we're looking at them in a specific order, the order of when I first lived there. Um, the list item element itself is pretty straightforward. There's not a whole lot to it. Notice that it can be used in an OL, a UL, or a menu element, which we're not gonna talk about in this series. Uh, and it just gives some additional examples of individual list items. But I think the best way to get this concept under your belt is a little practice, right? So uh, you should be able to download the code that's associated with this video, either from where you're currently streaming the video or from where you originally downloaded it. It should have a folder inside that zip file called Lesson08. Inside that folder, there is a before, after, and a work folder. In the before folder, there's uh, some opportunities for improvement to uh, the HTML file that I have in there. So I'm gonna right click and copy that and then go back to the work folder and paste it in. And this is where we're gonna do our work. I'm gonna open it up in Notepad, use whatever technique you're comfortable with to open it up. And you can see that I have uh, sets of list of items and then some other stuff that we'll get to later on in this lesson. But first of all, we're gonna start off by creating an unordered list because this list of names, you know, although you and I might be used to hearing these names in a specific order, if you're old enough to remember this. Uh, however, changing the order doesn't change the fact that each of these people are in the list, okay? And I'm gonna go ahead and create an OL. So notice I'm gonna start with a beginning and an ending OL for order list. And note that I'm just using my space key on my keyboard to create two spaces. This is purely for my for aesthetic purposes as I look at the code. It's definitely not necessary. HTML5 will ignore the white space for the most part. Now we're gonna look at the pre-tag again here in a little bit and we'll see how that would affect our use of white space. But I merely do this indentation for my own readability so I can see kind of the hierarchy or the ownership of the list items and its parent, in this case, the order list and I'm just wrapping list items an opening list item and a closing list item around each of the items and what I want to do is save the work that we've done with the UL and the OL and I want to open it up in Internet Explorer and just look at the default uh, uh, the way that it it uh, renders uh, with the default style sheet in Internet Explorer 9.0. The unordered list is rendered by default with just a series of bullets, whereas the ordered list is rendered with a series of numbers. Now, we're gonna learn later in this series of videos how we're gonna change that, uh, the, the bullets or the leading character, I guess you'd say, in front of each of these list items using cascading style sheets. And there are a number of options that are available to us there, but this again is the default way that it renders in the browser. Um, and so the ordered list has a, a series of numbers indicating that the, the uh, order is indeed important, okay? So let's go ahead and I'm gonna shut that tab down and I'm gonna close each of these tabs. There's one other list that we wanna look at and it has three parts to it. First of all, it's the DL element. 
And the DL element contains one or more DT elements and one or more DD elements. All right, and so the DL is a definition list. The DL element represents an association list consisting of zero or more name value groups, a description list. Each group must consist of one or more names followed by one or more values. Uh, within a single DL element, there should not be more than one DT element for each name. Okay, and so we can see some examples that they've used here. Uh, within a given DL element, there is a series of authors, maybe, for example, in a book that's been written, as well as a series of editors, which in this case, there's only one editor. But at any, at any rate, it, it designates the term authors and the description next to it using uh, a series of DD or definition description. Uh, elements okay and so that's really the difference between the two the DT element represents the term or the name part of a term description group in a description list and the DD element represents the description the definition or the value part of a term description group in a description list and so anytime you need an association between some notion some idea and a, a series of individual list items that are associated somehow with that notion you want to potentially create uh, a definition list using a DT for the definition term and then a series of DDs definition descriptions for each of the individual items all right and so let's put that into practice here uh, I have again in this lesson 08.html a couple of terms and their definitions and so what we're gonna do is just wrap a single DL around this entire block even though they're really not related, perhaps I have some article I'm working on where I want to create uh, an area where it uses, uh, it defines terms that were used in the article, maybe in a call out section, and I'm going to go ahead and create the definitions for each of those items. So I'm just wrapping each of these in a series of DTs and DDs. So in this case, autodidact is defined as a self taught person. Whereas utilitarianism, another definition term, it has two definitions. The first one, let's go ahead. And, and then the second one starts here. All right, so let's see how that's rendered now in our web browser. So I'm gonna save the work that I've done and then open it up in lesson08.html and notice the indentation levels for the definition term the there's no indentation but for the definitions below it there is a full I don't know 50 pixels maybe 100 pixels a, a full tab I guess you would say of, of white space leading into it to make sure you understand the hierarchy between the relationship between the two items the same is true for the second one where we have two definition terms or, or two definition descriptions underneath the definition term and you can see they're nicely aligned uh, as well. So you can see the clear uh, hierarchy of, of, the, of the items together. Okay. All right. So we've looked at uh, all three of the lists that we're going to look at in this, in this series. But, um, you know, at a high level, again, we're talking about groupings of items. In this case, we're looking at groupings of list items. But the authors of the HTML5 specification understood the concept of grouping in a more macro sense uh, and if we can see this let's close all this down here we are in where we were working with the OL the UL the LI the DL the DT and the DD it's all from this grouping content area here in in the documentation and you can see that there are several additional groupings uh, and when you think about it for example it has the paragraph element. Well, the paragraph element is a grouping of thematically similar content together, at least as, as it was defined in HTML5 specification, as we saw in lesson number four. In addition to the P element, we have the block quote element, which we learned about in lesson five. And there's also the figure and fig caption and the div element, which we learned about in the previous lessons as well. These are all responsible for grouping things just like our lists what they group is just a little bit different. All right, so what I wanna do is pick two additional items from this list and talk about them. We briefly, briefly talked about the pre-element. Let's go ahead and open that up in a new tab. 
and the pre element represents a block of pre formatted text in which structure is represented by typographic conventions rather than elements. And so it gives some examples of where this might be used. Uh, email with paragraphs indicated by blank lines, lists indicated by uh, lines prefixed with a bullet, and so on. Uh, fragments of computer code, that's the example that we saw when we were looking at the code element in lesson number four, with structure indicated, uh, indicated according to the conventions of that language, and then finally displaying ASCII art. So back to our examples here, you can see that whenever we open this web page up, uh, at the very bottom here, we have some computer code and then we have some ASCII art, but it loses its value, its meaning, because it's not formatted correctly. And so the pre, uh, the pre element will allow us to allow it to retain its formatting with the white space and line uh, continuations and things of that nature. So I'm just going to wrap pre's around both of these listings uh, pre around the public class hello one uh, public static void main this is just a snippet of c-sharp code to create a hello world example and then here you can clearly see as I pasted it in uh, some ASCII art of an alien all right uh, and now whenever we've added the pre tags to it and we open it up this will look like actual code and this will look like ASCII art okay and so that's all that we use the pre tag for Okay, um, so finally, let's talk about the HR element. Let's close all this down. And you can see that's another one of these items in the grouping content list here. And the HR element represents a paragraph level thematic break. For example, a scene change in a story or a transition to another topic within a section of a reference book. All right, so uh, it derives its name from a horizontal rule HR which uh, indicates presentation but it has been repurposed previously you would use it to just create a line across the screen okay and you think about it purely in terms of presentation but it's been repurposed as a grouping function in HTML5 to group or rather uh, to do the opposite to separate themes in a given document still its default style sheet as you're gonna see in a moment is a horizontal rule or horizontal line on a web page but now it has this rich semantic meaning so I think that probably the easiest way to do this is just to add an HR element and we can just type it like that or we can use a self enclosing uh, um, with a slash near the end of the angle bracket I'm just going to use the uh, the format that I probably will use now that we're working with HTML5 which is just the HR element by itself and we can see how it's rendered as we separate one thematic idea from a new thematic idea using this horizontal rule, this HR, all right? And it just, by default, with a default style sheet, Internet Explorer creates a horizontal line. However, again, as we looked in the specification, it, can, uh, it doesn't have to be rendered that way necessarily, and we're thinking more semantically. It's separating two different ideas, but are uh, added to the same document, okay? All right, so we've covered all the grouping content here or in previous lessons. So now let's move on to tables and learn their proper uses as well as their abuses in the next lesson. We'll see you there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. In this lesson, we're going to talk about tables. So whenever you need to render tabular data, you want to use the HTML5 table, which is comprised of about a dozen optional HTML5 elements. At a minimum, you probably want to define a header row, so a row that explains what each of the columns are for, as well as individual data rows that contain cells with the data you want to display to the end user. I'll be referencing the elements described in this document in the specification, the edition for web authors. We're going to scroll down, take a look at, and hit Control F to find tabular data. So this section, which is 4.9 in my version of the document, uh, we're going to look at many of these elements, including uh, the T body, the T head, the 
TR, the TD, and the TH, and so on, okay? Uh, it's also important to note that, again, many of the table's elements are completely optional. So you use the parts that are semantically necessary to convey the idea that you're trying to convey in your table of data. Uh, you're trying to avoid parts, uh, adding parts purely for presentational or styling purposes. That's the job of cascading style sheets again, okay? So uh, to really exercise this idea, instead of going through an academic discussion of each of these items, let's go ahead and have some fun. Uh, you'll wanna download the code that's associated with this video, wherever you're currently streaming the video from or wherever you originally downloaded this video to play, there should be a code file. If you open up that .zip file, there should be a folder called Lesson09. Inside of that folder, there is a before, after, and a work folder. So we want to take the before, and we're going to copy it, uh, the Lesson09.html file in the before folder, and copy it into the work folder. And so here's where we're going to do our work. We're going to open up this up in Notepad. So I'm going to right-click, open with Notepad, use whatever t uh, technique that is, uh, that is comfortable for you. All right, and so what I want to do at this point is I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to create a table of information that displays uh, the recent statistics for my favorite hockey player, Jonathan Taves of the Chicago Blackhawks. Um, and uh, I'm going to display his stats over the last couple of seasons, and I'm going to use a table to display that. So let's just go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm going to start with um, an H2 element just to kind of explain what this is for and give it an, a... Uh, name here so Jonathan Taves stats and then I'm going to start with a table element and then I'll just go ahead and create the closing table element for the very bottom and then what I want to do is create a header row and to create the header row I'm going to use the T head and then a closing T head and again notice that I am uh, indenting just to show levels for readability sake not because they have any real importance within HTML itself uh, but you know, the T head element is represents a row of data that's considered to be the heading row. There's also a T foot, which is similar, but obviously for a footing row for whenever you want to calculate totals or whatever the case might be. But here what we want to do is have a series of, of, um, of T H elements, and each of these represent a cell uh, a header cell of data considered to have the, the heading information, but doesn't contain any data, no numbers or statistics, for example, okay? So here we're gonna have three cells or three columns across the top, one for the season. And again, I can leave off the closing TH, but in my style, I like to include it. Goals. and assists all right now below the t head we're going to create a t body and this is where we'll, we'll include all of the individual row, rows of information the statistics themselves okay and so in the t body we're going to create a series of rows and you create a row by using the tr or table row element so open and closing tr and then because we want the first column to indicate the season, I'm going to go ahead and use a TH for that as well, which again is a table header, because it does provide some heading information, even though it's in the leftmost column. You see this often in um, when you're working with tables. And then we'll have table data, TDs, for the individual statistics themselves. All right, so for example, this season will be the 2009-2010 season. He had 25 goals and then 43 assists. All right, so at this point, we have enough information to see how it's rendered in a web browser. So let's go ahead and open it up. And you can see uh, it's not beautiful, but that's not important right now. We want to convey intent. And so we have our header row, our header cell, that includes the season and then the individual statistics 25 and 43 uh, for goals and assists. Okay, so let's just continue on uh, and, uh, and uh, flesh this out completely. I'm gonna take the same 
tact here. In fact, now that I have this structure in place and I know I'm going to need several of these, I'm just going to copy and paste this a couple of times. That should be sufficient. And we're going to create the uh, 2010 to 2011 season. And then we'll create the uh, 2011 to 2012 uh, season. I think I forgot something here. There we go. And I guess I don't need this last one. All right, so here we have the 32 and 44. And then here we have 29 and 28. All right, so let's go ahead and see what that looks like. All right, more of the same. Great. Now, for example, what if I needed to create a row that describes something that he was involved in like the Olympics, for example, and I wanted to span the entire uh, the entire row. I can use one cell, and then I'm going to stretch it out using an attribute of the table data called call span. And I'm going to set that equal to three. So whatever data I put in here, so I want to just make a note: 2009 to 2010, also played for Canada at Olympics. All right, now this might change my formatting of my table a little bit, pushing things out a little bit, but you can see I'm able to create one cell that spans the entire width of the table by using this call span. In this case, I want it to stretch three columns. All right, so where did I get columns from? When you create these cells, you're creating essentially columns. All right, so at the very bottom of this, let's, let's add some things up here. And to do that, we're going to add a T foot. And so we'll create a TR and a closing TR. And then we'll use a header to explain that this row is for the totals, OK? Again, much of what I'm doing here is optional. It's just a matter of using the correct markup for what I'm intending to do here. And so, again, the data will be 86 and 115, I happen to know. And so what would you expect to see here? Well, an additional row. And it looks nothing different, even though it's a footer as opposed to the body. But that's what... Again, CSS is for to style this up and to make it look great. Okay, and I think that's all that I'm going to do for now. Uh, there are other uh, there are other tags that we could use optional tags for creating call groups uh, and individual columns, and that would allow us to style. If you had like you know ten um, uh, ten columns uh, represented by your cells here, how many cells you've created, you could create a series of of call groups and style them differently so that you can see like a light gray or a white background alternatively for each of the cells or each of the call groups, all right? Uh, so one last thing before we conclude this, uh, in this series of lessons, I try to ignore much of the history of HTML. However, in the case of the lowly, much aligned HTML table, it's hard to ignore. You may hear people say, developers should never use tables for layout, and I completely agree with that. However, that does not mean that you should never use tables at all. When web browsers first arrived back in 1992, 93, I guess, somewhere around there, uh, they had limited capabilities for positioning major sections of a website on the screen. Some, somebody realized that you could use tables for this purpose to uh, create basically a, a series of grid cells for your entire web page and then it would make it easy to align things on the web page by turning it into a series of grid cells with rows and columns. However, there are several problems with this approach. From an HTML5 perspective, the most obvious problem is that semantically a table has a precise meaning, a representation of table data like we did here, we created here in this lesson. 
using it for layout abuses the purpose of the table. Furthermore, it creates fixed width pages. Now, most of the internet, quite frankly, uses fixed width pages, but that's changing. As we're gonna see later in this series, the new goal for web page layout and design should be a responsive design or a fluid or liquid design that allows the web page to adapt correctly depending on whether you're working on a small device or a large screen. The layout of the page will change based on the current dimensions of the web browser uh, where the uh, 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 given the space available for the given device that the, the user is looking at your web page with. Again, this is a topic for much later in this series, but positioning our content in tables would take us back to a thought process prevalent in 1995, uh, not 2012, 2013, and beyond. All right, so if you ever get tempted to use tables for uh, and putting paragraphs inside of them in order to get everything positioned, absolutely stop yourself. Don't do it. Don't go down that road. Uh, at the very minimum, you'll be ostracized by... Uh, um, by small children in the streets, but uh, worst case scenario is that you're not really setting yourself up for the future of web development. Okay, so I think that's all I need to say about that. Uh, tables serve a, a purpose, use them for that purpose. We'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. In this lesson, we're going to talk about HTML5 forms. Up to now, all of our HTML5 work has been to display information to the user. In this lesson, we begin to retrieve information from the user. And I know you've used forms on web pages before. If you've ever signed up for a username and password for a website, if you've ever registered for a webinar or some other event, if you've ever purchased anything on the internet, then you've used a form. And there are different types of form fields that you can use to collect different types of data, or rather to restrict the types of selections or choices that a user can make. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about forms and even build a simple form with several uh, elements on it. In the next lesson, then we're going to add some additional elements and talk about validation on the client, which is new to HTML5. So let's start with the basics of forms. Whenever a user types information into form fields, like a text box, for example, or makes selections in form fields, like a checkbox or a radio button, for example, uh, they have to somehow trigger the submission of all the form information that they have filled out back to the server. All the information in the form, so all the data that they type or the selections that they make, it all gets bundled up and sent to the web server. How the data is bundled up and the destination of the data is determined by the settings in the HTML element called the form element. And so here's a typical form element. We'll be writing one of these on our own here in just a little bit. But we have a form element and a closing form element. And then there are two important attributes, the method and the action. And you can see that I've set the method equal to post. Post is one of several different types of HTTP messages. A post message says that it should you should encode up all of the form data and bundle it into the body. Think about putting it inside of an envelope, I guess you could say, of the HTTP message. If that data is sensitive, then it will typically encode all of the stuff in the envelope, all of the data in the message body, using a secure sockets layer certificate. And so when you take a look at the action attribute in our form, you'll see that there's an HTTPS. The S on the end typically indicates that you're working with the secure sockets layer certificate, okay? so the HTTP message of post is in contrast to the HTTP get message and that bundles up all the data and puts it in the query string as a set of name value pairs. So that's roughly the equivalent of taking all the form data and sticking it on the front of the envelope, okay, where anybody can see it as you mail it off and to uh, put it into the mail system. Honestly, most of the time you're not going to want to do this because it limits the amount of data that you can send. There's only so much space on that envelope's, you know, uh, front side <laughs> and it prevents the data from the benefit of being encrypted by a secure sockets layer certificate anybody can read whatever's on the front of that envelope if you were to encrypt that the postmaster would look at it and say I have no idea what you want me to do with this it's just garbled right but if you were to encrypt the, the information inside the envelope that would be just fine it could still make it to its destination so that's think about it roughly in those terms if you want to learn more about the differences between HTTP get and HTTP post check out this Wikipedia article as a good starting point 
All right, so we talked about the method equals post, but now let's talk about the action. That attribute is the destination of the form's submission. Typically, the form submission will be to a server-side technology like ASP.NET or PHP or CGI using Perl or a number of other uh, server-side related technologies. Now, that's out of scope for this series of lessons, but ASP.NET would be a great next step for you if you want to learn how to do serious web development, where you're interacting with databases, even taking that form field information that people submit, saving it into a database, or retrieving it out and creating new web pages, uh, creating a template and filling in the areas of the page with data from a database to make it dynamic. Uh, but at any rate, that's for another day, another time. In this lesson, I can show you all the types of data that we can collect on a form on the client side using HTML5. And those form fields are defined between an opening and closing form tag. So for this video, I'm going to use a modified version of the example that we find here in the HTML5 specification. Notice I'm on this version of the specification called the Edition for Web Authors, just as a reminder. We're looking through the table of contents for the entire specification. I'm going to uh, uh, open up my find uh, uh, toolbar by using control F on the keyboard and then typing in forms. And you can see that that brings me to section 410 and there's quite a bit of information under 410. That's because forms are a really large topic. We're only going to look at a small subset of that. But if we were to open this up in a new tab, it uses a pizza shop, an online pizza delivery uh, form as an example and so I want to create a modified version of this for our purposes but feel free to look through this and to complete the example using their code instead of my code after you've uh, finished this video just to learn a little bit more alright so my example is going to be an absolute minimalist approach frankly there will be a lot missing in my example with regards to attributes of the elements on the page uh, and so I'm going to just work through and point out the various elements along the way, but there will be much more to learn after this lesson is over. Okay, And to that end, make sure that you download the code file that's associated with this video. You can download it from wherever you originally downloaded this video to watch it locally on your computer, or from wherever you're streaming the video currently. Uh, there should be a zip file with code in it. There is a folder called Lesson 10 inside of that zip folder and there will be three subfolders before after and work what i want to do is go to the before folder i'm going to copy the lesson10.html page i'm going to paste it into the work folder where we're going to do all of our work and then like we've done in every other video i'm going to right click and select open with notepad use any technique you're comfortable with but this will be a good starting point for creating our own forms so we're going to start off by creating a opening and closing form tag as we said at the outset, we need some attributes here. In the first attribute, we'll create a post, and then an action, and we're just gonna set it to a fictitious page that doesn't really exist. This will not work. Uh, if we were to create a full ASP.NET example, then this might be the basis for that, but if we were to hit the submit button, once we get to that point on the form, nothing will happen because form.aspx does not exist today okay all right so let's continue on then and we want to collect the user's name so we're going to use uh, a text box that allow them to type in their name into our form so I'm going to open and close the paragraph and then I'm going to open up a label and inside that label I'm going to say customer name and then I'm going to open up an input uh, input element and there are different types of input elements so I'm going to select the type that I want to use. I'm going to use a text box. So type equals text. And then I want to give it an ID and a name. And I'll discuss that a little bit later, why I'm doing this for all these elements. But I'm going to name it the same, customer name and customer name. Just be sure to follow along. We'll explain why we're doing this much later in this lesson. All right. And if at this point we were to save what we've done and open it up, in Internet Explorer by just double clicking the web page from our work folder you can see we get a text box and so I can start typing in the name uh, and just keep typing and typing and typing and typing so clearly this isn't a good situation what we want to do is limit the number of characters that somebody can type into our text box and to do that I'm gonna set another attribute called max length and I'm gonna set that to 10 might be a little short for a name but it'll again allow us to at least exercise the max length attribute so now as I begin to type 
notice that it stops at about 10 characters, which is perfect. All right, so let's continue on. The next thing that I want to do is retrieve information like uh, the size of the pizza that the individual is ordering and then the pizza toppings. And so with regard to size, there's only three options, small, medium, and large. And so you can't choose small and large at the same time. We want to restrict the selections that the user can make. And to do that, we're going to use a series of radio buttons. Uh, radio buttons are usually just circular buttons as they're represented in HTML. And you can select one, and when you choose one, the other two will become unselected. If you choose one of those, then your original selection will go away. So you can only make one selection from that list. And to kind of represent all of the given options together, we're going to kind of enclose them in a field set. And uh, let me go ahead and type it out, then I'll explain what a field set is. So let's start with field set and then a closing field set and inside of the field set I'm gonna create a legend I'll talk about what that is here in a moment and we're gonna just call this legend pizza size all right and so a field set groups form elements together with a common name and the legend provides the name in this case pizza size all right uh, and the legend has to be the first child of the field set. Just a little technical note there. So you'll see that once we add our individual uh, radio buttons here in between the field set, open and close field set elements, uh, you'll see that it creates a little box around it with a name in the upper left hand corner by default using Internet Explorer's default style sheet. Of course, we could change that. But let's create a series of, of paragraphs a series of labels and inside of those labels we're going to put an input type equals and instead of a text field we're going to use a radio for radio button and now I'm going to give each radio the same name size because each of them are going to be submitting either a small size a medium size or a large size and so to differentiate each of those sizes we're going to give it a value for example small and then outside of the boundaries of the input element, I want to type whatever the user will see. So for like a example, a 10 inch pizza. All right, so this is the friendly text that the user sees. This is the value that will be submitted back to the web server if the user selects the small sized pizza. All right, and of course we want to finish out our label as well. So now what I'm gonna do, I'm just going to highlight that entire line and copy and paste it three times because we want each of them to have the same name value. We will change each of the values, like medium, for example, and large, and then the text that the user sees, for example, medium, uh, 12 inch, and then the large will be a six or a 14 inch, okay? So now, if we were to save this and then view it inside of our web browser, it would look like this. And so you can see the field set is what gives this a boundary. It puts a box around it. And you can see the legend up here kind of sits on top of that boundary. And here I have a series of radio buttons. And by selecting one, it deselects all the other options, okay? Which is perfect for small, medium, and large. Next thing I want to do is create a field set that will allow us to capture which toppings the user wants on their pizza. So let's start with a field set and a closing field set. And then we're going to add a legend, a closing legend. And here we're going to type in pizza toppings. Great. And beneath that, all right, I'm going to start with a paragraph. And inside that, I'm going to add a label. So I'll go ahead and close out the label because I forgot to do that last time. And then inside the label, I'm going to add an input. The type of input I want to use is a checkbox. All right. And then I'm going to give it a name. and We're just going to call this toppings. All right. And then I'm going to set the value for this individual checkbox. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and leave it empty for now because I want to use this sort of as a, a template for the other items. I'm going to have four items total available for the pizzas. And so we're going to add bacon. So the first time I type in the value of bacon is what gets submitted to the server. This is 
the text that the user will see in their web browser, all right? So cheese, and we might say like, for example, extra cheese. Onion. And then finally, mushroom. I guess we're going mostly vegetarian here. I guess bacon is, wouldn't fall in that category. <laughs> Okay, but now let's go ahead and save this and let's see what we come up with. There we go. So we have another field set, box around it with our legend pizza toppings, and we can select as many of these as we want to. All right. Let's go ahead and minimize that. And now let's ask what type of field set, or I'm sorry, what type of crust the user wants. So we're going to go back to a paragraph and here I'm going to add um, a select Let me close off the paragraph. So here's a begin and end select and inside of that we want to create a series of options. And so we're going to say uh, normal And I'm going to copy and paste this a couple times. Uh, here we got Chicago deep dish. And we'll say that's uh, plus $2. And then we're going to go New York thin. All right. And uh, I want to also designate a value for each of these options and the value is what will be sent back to the web server for this given select control and we need to give this a name of crust so the name will be crust and then the user can choose at this point just one option either and we'll use a little coding here a c1 a c2 or c3 so hey Vinny, we've got a c3 go ahead and you know, work up more New York thin crusts for us, okay? Something along those lines. Um, so here we go, let's go ahead and save this and open it up in a browser and you can see what it looks like. All right, so here is a drop down list box where we can choose normal, deep dish, or New York thin, great. And it doesn't take up any vertical spacing. Now what we could do is add an attribute called multiple and just by adding that single attribute, notice what happens. Uh, it changes from a drop-down list to show all the options that are available. Now you can restrict that size and make it only show like three or five options. This is what I was talking about a little bit earlier, okay? Um, so at any rate, what if I wanted to pre-select the normal option? Well, what we could do, or pre-select the Chicago deep dish because that's our specialty. So we'll just add the selected uh, attribute and refresh and you can see by default Chicago deep dish is selected. I believe this will work on any of these. Uh, let's try selected and radio type medium selected. And let's see what we get. Uh, actually, I think it's checked. There we go. Checked is the right option. Uh, similar in thought, just a different, uh, just a different attribute. Okay. So by default, a medium and all pizzas will include onion by default unless you deselect it or if you change the size. Okay. Alrighty. Let's continue on here, and I'm going to add an area for the user who's ordering a pizza. to type in any delivery instructions. And I'm gonna use a different type of input box called a text area. So it has a whole different element name. And we're gonna give it a name equal comments. And here we're gonna give it a number of columns and a number of rows. So we'll give it uh, 50 columns in width and then five rows in height. 
And then also we're going to add the max length and only allow a thousand characters. So let's go ahead and save that and look at it. And you can see I've done something wrong here. The problem is I didn't add a closing text area. And what it did was it treated everything uh, after the opening text area as text that belongs inside. So we might say uh, inside here, how do we get to your house? All right, and you can see how that will manifest itself here. And notice that it uses kind of a pre, so we may want to even remove some of this if we wanted to default that. All right, there we go. And we can delete this and say, go to the end of the street, blah, 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 okay. Um, and I think that's an important point too because we can pre-fill these, uh, like the text area, for example, the, the text input by adding a value to begin with, what is your name? Now, admittedly, this wouldn't be too smart because it would force the user to have to go in and delete all that and then type. And there are some uh, ways for us to kind of, you'll see this effect on some forms uh, that they put like a little description of what the form is inside of the box in a very light gray font and then you put your mouse cursor in and it disappears. Uh, they're using uh, a combination of JavaScript and a plugin called jQuery. If you wanna know more about at least the basics of what the foundation you'll need to, to introduce that into your web forms. You'll want to watch the JavaScript and jQuery foundational series also on channel nine. Okay. So at any rate, I just wanted you to know about the value. Let's go ahead and remove that for now and how we were able to introduce information into our text area. And I'm removing that as well. Now up to this point, we haven't given the user any way to actually say, okay, I've filled out all the information on my form. Let's go ahead and, and send that information to the web server and continue on with the ordering process. So we need a submit button. And we'll talk about the different kinds of, of input types for submitting forms. Uh, the easiest way to do this is input type equals submit value equals continue to step two. Uh, but we can also do something called a reset. So you'll see this sometimes in older web pages. Reset value equals a reset values. And let's see how these are manifested. All right, so now at the very bottom, you can see we have a continue to step two. If we were to click that, uh, it will try to open up form.aspx. Obviously, we don't have that, so we get this uh, Internet Explorer cannot display the web page, and that's perfectly fine. We'd have to pick that up in an ASP.NET series, all right? But if we were to make selections here, like customer name, uh, the options that we want, New York Thin Crust, and type in some delivery instructions, and then hit uh, reset values, uh, notice we use that input type equals reset and it resets all the options back to their original. Okay, so those are the two different types of, of buttons that we can use and there are a couple more. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, one last thing that I want to talk about is the label. Uh, up to this point, we've been wrapping uh, the label around the entire control and any text inside of it. However, there's another way to use label control. Let me just demonstrate here. Um, or the label element rather, we can add a for attribute. And so we can say it's for the comments and it should look exactly the same. It's just a different way of doing it and you'll see that used sometimes. All right, so delivery instructions, there you go. Okay, so one thing I wanted to point out and I had, it wasn't really consistent with this, um, but I, I started doing this at the very top. Uh, you'll notice that in this case, I use the attribute name and the attribute ID. Typically, the ID is used on the client side for scripting, uh, like whenever you're creating JavaScript to create some validation 
on the client uh, to make sure that somebody filled in the information here it wasn't too long that perhaps it really does look like a phone number uh, some initial validation on the client side using JavaScript you'll typically want to reference items using an ID whereas on the server it expects to see a name that's part of what gets packaged up in the HTTP post and stuffed into the HTTP uh, uh, request um, envelope I guess you would say and sent over to the web server and so you have to use the name for that purpose and so I would recommend using both on your elements and then keeping the names identical just for clarity in your own mind whenever you're doing web development okay let's continue on here uh, we've seen several examples of input elements we've looked at input type equals text input type equals radio input type equals checkbox input type equal or select rather and then also the text area input type equals submit input type equals reset uh, but there are uh, quite a few other uh, input elements that can be used you can see these on screen right now here's a complete list um, the ones that we haven't looked at are input type equals password hidden uh, file if you want to upload or allow a user to upload a file there's some work that has to be done on the server as well to accept the file but uh, creating the ability for somebody to click a button and choose from a file picker off of their local computer which file they want to upload uh, that gives it that capability um, there's also we looked at the submit and reset there's an image for an image button so you can use a, a image instead of uh, the battleship gray style uh, buttons like we've used here in our example and then there's also just a type equals button and then there are different types of buttons uh, there's the button type equals button button type equals submit and the button type equals reset so you might be wondering what the difference is between input type equals submit and button type equals submit and so basically the button has more CSS properties available to it for the purpose of styling uh, one of the biggest features is the ability to include include images uh, on the button itself using the button control or the button element. So the creator of a tool called Wufu, a popular forms product on the web, he wrote up a really interesting uh, blog post about his experiences at this URL that you see on screen. It's one of the best articles for an in-depth look and I recommend that you look into that if you're interested in that information. Okay, so to wrap up this lesson, I just want to say that this is really only half of the story when it comes to forms in HTML5. We've covered the basics that are supported by older versions of HTML, and in the next lesson, I want to specifically target the new features that are added in HTML5. I promised that I would try to avoid this. However, the fact of the matter is that at the time that I recorded these lessons, Internet Explorer 9 doesn't support many of the HTML5 features related to forms. However, uh, Internet Explorer 10.0 does support many of them, uh, and so we'll want to see that in action in the next lesson. But don't worry, I'll explain the ramifications uh, of, of using these new HTML5 form elements in the next lesson. Be sure you watch it. We'll see you there. Thank you. As I mentioned briefly in the previous video, we've been using Internet Explorer 9 in the lessons up until this point, but Internet Explorer 10 has a more full implementation of HTML5 forms, and I wanted to demonstrate that. Now, at the time when I'm recording this, Internet Explorer 10 is in a preview phase and can only be run from a preview version of Windows 8. <laughs> so by the time you watch this, you might have the full version of Internet Explorer 10, and if so, you can easily follow along. Otherwise, you might just want to consider this a preview of what's to come. So prior to HTML5, a user would type data into form fields and then submit that form back to the server like we saw in the previous lesson. Now, all user input should be considered suspect. In other words, we should expect it to be guilty of being in the wrong format, contain the wrong range of valid values, and so on, until it's proven innocent. Developers create code to perform validation of the data, sort of a first check of the data, to make sure that it contains values in the desired range, that a required field of information wasn't left empty, um, whether it was numeric, alphanumeric, or conforms to some pattern, like an email address or URL, or, or it has at least one item selected from a list, and so on. So these validation checks could take two forms. There's validation on the server side that's written in code logic like C-sharp, Visual Basic, 
Perl, PHP, or whatever back-end server technology is required. On the front end, on the client, developers would also create validation checks of JavaScript. It typically is used for this purpose to perform some preliminary checks. So why do you check the data in both places, both on the front end and on the back end? Well, the idea is to reduce the time for feedback to the end user. In other words, to avoid a full post back to the server, and then we get to tell the user as quickly as possible why the form could not be submitted. If the user has JavaScript disabled on their web browser, then no problem, the server would be, uh, check would be performed uh, with nearly identical validation uh, on the form submission before proceeding then with additional logic, saving them to a database, or whatever the case might be. However, in HTML5, no JavaScript is necessary to perform validation checks on the client, again, if the browser supports it. So what we want to do here is, uh, again, using the beta version uh, at the time of this recording, uh, I have Lesson 11. You should be able to download this zip file from wherever you downloaded um, uh, this video or you're currently watching this video and there will be just like before a before after in a work folder in the before folder there's simply a lesson 11 dot html i'm going to copy that and paste it back over here in the work folder where i'm going to do all of my work and i'm going to open this up in notepad and you can see that well just for fun i went ahead and let me make sure this is in a viewable area here uh i, I added some some CSS right into the head section of our document. So just ignore this. You'll see it as we begin to work with uh, with the form, how it how it formats it. Okay. So let's start off with some of the new input types that are available uh, to make your job a lot easier. Let's start with uh, an email. So paragraph, a label, and then I'm also going to use a span just for styling purposes input okay so input type equals email name equals email input and I'll also make this a required field so notice that attribute I can just turn it on like that and then I'll go ahead and close the label and then close the paragraph okay hopefully you got that all right so now let's save this and let's see it opened up in Internet Explorer. All right, so let's try to submit this form. And it says, what? Well, this is a required field. I didn't write any JavaScript, did no styling to get this little red box um, highlighted around the input box, did nothing to get the little pop-up bubble. This is probably stylable. I haven't gone quite that far with this example. Uh, however, let's go ahead now, since it's a required field, let's go ahead and try to type something in, like uh, just junk. All right, and click submit, and it says you must enter a valid email address. Wow, that's awesome. So uh, let me send it to an email address. I never check, so don't even bother sending an email here because it won't work. And now we try to submit it. It tried to submit the form. Clearly, we don't have uh, anything to submit it to, but at least it passed the validation check and continued on. Okay, so great. So type equals email. Very neat. What other kinds of specific types are there? Well, right now in the specification, there's one called telephone or TEL. It's a little bit of a different case, though. We're not going to get quite the satisfaction out of it. And I'm just going to type out this note. Oddly, the spec says the browser should do nothing special and then I'm gonna just go hmm that sounds kinda weird but if that's what the specification says let's see how this behaves so let's go ahead and put uh, Bob Tabor at yahoo.com to pass that check and here we're just gonna put in some random numbers and then click submit and it goes ahead and takes it so unfortunately there's really nothing all that special about type equals tell but it is supported and I wanted to point it out. At least semantically, you would know that this input box was for the purpose of the telephone, but it doesn't have any inherent um, validation capabilities. Okay, let's move on uh, to something that is a little more interesting. We'll start with a label, another span, whoops. 
and let's create a URL input. Input type equals URL name equals URL input, just the name I'm giving it, and I'm going to make this required. And finish it up like that. All right, so let's save that, and let's see that one in action. All right, so here we go. Um, um, uh, we'll just go ahead and put some random numbers in there. And then here we'll just put some random text and go ahead and click submit. And it says you must enter a valid URL. So let's just go www.learnvisualstudio and then just click submit. And it says you must enter a valid URL. It won't take it because it requires .com, .net, .co UK, whatever the case might be. And uh, apparently, oh, it needs HTTP colon slash slash too, I believe. Yes. Okay. So they're passed validation. Excellent. All right. And so now moving on, let's try another one here. In fact, let's go H2. In fact, I forgot some H2s around here just for bear with me for a second here while I catch up. We'll call this URL. Here we're going to call this uh, numeric values. And the first one we'll do is a number input, and here we'll add our input type equals number name equals number input and required. Okay, let's see how that looks. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, type in Tabor at yahoo.com. Just put some numbers here. Let's go HTTP keys on the uh, bing.com, just to make it short. And then a numerical input, let's just put some crazy combination of numbers and letters and it accepted it hmm let's try just some text information all right so let's just type in something uh, some letters here and then click submit and notice that it doesn't really give us a message about numeric values it just kind of empties it out and said this is a required field. If I type in a real number, it'll go ahead and let it submit. So I think this might be a function of the fact that this is a preview release. They're probably still uh, tweaking some of the uh, bits of functionality, but at least it is supported from valid from a validation purpose. All right, let's move on. There's another kind of interesting one called uh, a range input that I like the how it's rendered in Internet Explorer. And I'm going to set its pre-selected value to uh, 42. And I'm just going to say uh, off to the side value set to 42. Uh, by default, values accepted are between 1 and 100, just so you know. Okay, so I'll see this in action, assuming I typed it all correctly. And notice how it's rendered here as kind of a progress bar. It's a, a range bar. So here I can, as I move the number, notice a little box overhead. And again, it goes from 0. I said between 1 and 100. It's actually 0 and 100. Let's go ahead and change that just for posterity. Great. Very cool. All right, so let's move on now. And I want to demonstrate another cool little thing here. It's called a data list. And um, you might have, for example, a need for a combo box, which is kind of like a text input box, 
kind of like a select box, but it'll let you type in different values from what is in the selection box that drops down. So it's different than the, uh, the typical select that we saw in HTML in the previous, HTML forms in the previous lesson. So here, let's do this. I'll go to the next line here, input type equals text. So we're just gonna use a normal text box and we're gonna set a property call list to something called some list. And I'm gonna define a data list and I'm gonna set the ID equal to some list to link these two together. So the ID of this data list is some list and I'm gonna reference it here in my input type equals text. And let's close our data list. And in between our opening and closing data list, I'm gonna create a number of options. Option label equals first, value equals, all right. All right, we'll do second and third. Okay, and now let's see this in action. Or actually, let me finish this up. All right, so let's try this out now. Go down to the bottom here. And you can see that whatever is in the value field will be displayed here in the list. So I can just escape and say, I wanna type in fourth, but it, as I typed in the F, it limited the list down to just those, and I can use the arrow key to select one and then use the tab key, or I'm sorry, let's try that again, the first, and then just hit the enter key to select the given item in the, in the data list. Okay, pretty cool. All right, so in addition to all these new HTML5 controls, there are a number of new attributes that you can apply that are kind of global in, in nature and can be applied to just about any of the controls. Uh, so for example here, let's create another quick example. And here is autofocus. So we'll just create an input type equals text, and then we'll use this autofocus, or we could set it autofocus equals true. Um, just We'll just use it like that, for example, and then slash label slash P, okay. Save it, and now let's refresh. And notice that the cursor automatically goes to the autofocus. So this is where we would begin typing in our form. We're gonna use the shift tab or tab key to move on from there. All right, but at least autofocus will put the cursor into a specific form field so the user can begin typing as soon as the page loads. Pretty cool. Um, let's go on from there and look at pattern. And we'll use a, um, a pattern that I basically already created. Uh, truth be told, I stole it off the internet. So if you see this floating around, don't be alarmed. Okay, so this is for, let me do this. Int use a valid or invalid zip code. So it'll either work with a five or nine digit zip code. And let me just quickly fill in this. Put anything in there. HTTP, bing.com. Leave that selected. That was second, the autofocus. So here we go, Bob Tabor, yahoo.com. Let me just put some numbers in there. Agentpcam.com, uh, number. Autofocus, we'll just type anything, doesn't really matter. And here in the pattern, 
let's go ahead and just type in too many numbers and click the submit button and it says you must use this format now it doesn't show the format but if I were to do just five numbers it'll take it okay awesome all right moving on uh, we can also use this and I see this effect used often this placeholder So we're going to set the placeholder property to just hello world. And this is different than an initial value that we could um, default our, our, uh, our form fields to. This will actually disappear as we start typing. So it's useful for giving a hint inside of a, inside of a form field. Let's see if we can get back there real quick. Okay, see it's kind of in a grayed out font, hello world. As we put our mouse cursor inside of it, it disappears. So it's there just for a contextual hint. All right, and moving on. We've already looked at the required field, so I'll just go ahead and put that in there for reference sake. But we've already seen that one at work earlier. move on to the next one which will be the step so here we're going to use type equals number this is specific for number and I'll just type a hint um, must be divisible by five All right, so this is the last one, and let's fill out our form one more time. Placeholder, let's type anything we want in there, required anything we want in there. All right, step. So I'm going to type in 74, and then I click Submit, and it says you must enter a valid value. All right, but if I type in 75 and click Submit, it'll take it. Okay? All right, so uh, again, coming down the pipe, and there are others that are defined in the HTML5 specification that are exciting, and I'm sure over time these they will be included as well. Uh, and so it's kind of a great time to be a web developer because it takes less and less code to accomplish just as much as uh, it would require to use a bunch of custom JavaScript to accomplish these same sorts of things. All right, great. So uh, I think that pretty much wraps up our discussion of HTML5 proper. We're going to move on to CSS beginning in the next video. We'll see you there. Thank you. In this lesson, we'll formally introduce the topic of cascading style sheets. We'll talk about the purpose of CSS, how to define styles in line, on page, and in an external file. We'll examine the most common selectors and briefly overview uh, some advanced CSS3 selectors that have just been added uh, to get to portions of the HTML5 document that we want to apply a style to. We'll look at both normal CSS3 syntax as well as some special syntax used in special situations. And then I think this is probably one of the most important parts about understanding CSS, the order in which the web browser will interpret CSS styles that have been defined when there are selectors that are in conflict or that when they overlap. Which one will win? Which one will get its style applied? And what is that order of precedence? Okay, so let's start at the beginning, the purpose of cascading style sheets. Uh, I've repeated it over and over up to this point in this series, so it shouldn't be much of a surprise. The purpose of CSS is to apply visual styles to the HTML5 code that you write uh, and affect the presentation of the content. A style is simply a collection of name value pairs representing a visual attribute 
of a given HTML5 element. Uh, could be the typeface, the font size or color, the background color or an image used for the background, the amount of padding or margin for a given area, and much more. So we're going to examine many of these common properties that you can modify in CSS throughout the remainder of this series. Uh, so a style, you've seen it before, it looks something like this. Uh, in this particular case, we have uh, several different parts to our style. First of all, is the selector. Uh, we are selecting, in this case, the H1 element, every H1 element in the document. Uh, the styling will be applied to all elements that match that requirement, namely all H1 elements. Secondly, we have a set of curly braces that kind of define the body of the style that we'll define. And third, uh, inside of the curly braces, there's a collection of name value pairs that are separated by semicolons. Uh, and then finally, in the innermost parts on each line, you see a combination of the CSS property name, colon, and then the value you're setting it to. And so the colon is the separator between the property name and the value you're setting it to. All right, so cascading style sheets. Uh, the word cascading describes the nature of how styles are applied. There could be many style sheets, or at least many styles that are applied that affect a given HTML5 element on your web page. And there's this natural order in how they're interpreted and applied when there's a collision between the two styles. Again, let me push that deeper down into this lesson. We'll talk about that order of precedence in a little bit. But before we leave this topic of the basic format uh, of a style definition, there's a number of common conventions that I've seen uh, where developers and designers have formatted their cascading style sheet styles, uh, and I actually prefer the most, one of the more, ver, more verbose styles, uh, only because I'm teaching and it's easier to point things out. Uh, first, there's what I would describe as the clearest way to write your CSS, where you separate everything out kind of on its own line. Uh, some people even prefer to add one more space between the style uh, selector, in this case H1, and that opening curly brace. And then there's some people on the other end of the spectrum who prefer to keep everything on one line. Now, it's important to note in HTML5 and in CSS, uh, white space is ignored. So when you do layout and you do indentation, uh, it is purely for your own readability of the code. In fact, some designers would prefer to keep like I said, what you see right here, uh, the entire style defined on a single line so that they can at least look down the left-hand column and see all the selectors to find the one that they want to work instead of weeding through bodies uh, mixed along inside, you know, with the actual selector names. And that's fine. Uh, some designers are particular about the order of the CSS properties that are listed in each given style. Uh, now there are a few cases where there's a technical reason to keep a specific order. However, in most cases, it's up to you to decide how to approach this. One of the most common is to keep the properties in alphabetical order. Now that's fine. I'm kind of lazy. I'll probably just wind up uh, you know, typing something and leaving it as is and not kind of going back and combing through my comb, my code and making sure that every uh, property name is in alphabetical order. But if I had a client or a team that uh, used this as a standard, certainly that's something I would be aware of. So my advice to you is uh, take a look on the internet. There's plenty of uh, opinions about which styles to choose and why. Uh, my advice is just to pick one style and go with it. Be consistent and never don't look back. Don't, don't obsess about that. Okay, we've up to this point been using an external style sheet when we worked in lesson three, and there's basically three different ways to define styles. Uh, the only one I really recommend is to use an external style sheet when you're working with a large project or a real project. Uh, so you'll see me in the next couple of lessons use inline styles, meaning that you can add the style attribute to any given HTML5 element like you see listed here. So I have an H1 with a style equals, and then a number of uh, uh, CSS property names, colon, the value I'm setting it to, semicolon, and then another set of name value pairs. Um, hopefully you'll immediately recognize the problems with this approach. First and foremost, you're mixing in the HTML5 structure uh, and semantic meaning of the H1 with the styling and presentation of the CSS. Uh, and secondly, it makes styling less portable. You can't easily take these styles you define out 
and put them in and use them across your entire project or multiple projects. So if you ever need to redesign your entire website, you're gonna to have to go in and touch every single web page. Clearly that's an advantage to using the external style sheet instead of embedding the styles directly into uh, the style uh, attribute. Uh, furthermore, as we'll see in a little while, styles that are defined in line take precedence over any other style. So if you were in the future to define an external style sheet uh, for the page, but you left in the styles on a tag by tag basis, uh, those styles would win out over the ones that you defined uh, in an external file. Okay, something to be aware of. So the second way to define CSS styles is on page. And so if you watch the previous lesson in lesson 11, if you take a look at the before, um, I did some work and I said, hey, just ignore this. But you can see what I did here. Uh, I created a style tag, opening and closing style tag inside of the head section of my, of my uh, HTML page. And then we did all of our work down here in this form area. But here I was able to define a number of of uh, styles just on the page now okay the good news is that uh, we're able to pull this out and I could easily take this out and put it into its own document but as it exists right now it's still problematic because the presentation code is still mixed in with the HTML5 structural code um, so at any rate it's a step in the right direction but still the best way and the approach that I would highly 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 recommend that you take throughout the rest of your career is to put all your CSS into one or more external files dedicated to uh, cascading style sheets uh, and so in this way you can reuse the styles across your entire website or utilize it in multiple websites if you need to make sweeping changes to your website you merely need to change the CSS in one place and then the changes will propagate everywhere where that external CSS file is used so uh, to include an external CSS file, you use the link element. And we've already seen this in our lesson three, right? Link rel equals style sheet, href equals styles.css, type equals text slash CSS, media equals all. So what do these attributes mean? I think we already talked about them at the time. Just a quick reminder, the rel attribute is the relationship, the link's relationship to the current document. In this case, it's a style sheet. Secondly, the location is the href. So where do you, go, where do you find this? Um, I've kept the styles in the same directory, but we talked about URLs when we were talking about anchor tags and all the many different ways, whether absolute or relative, ways of, of defining some sort of, of um, reference to an external uh, file, okay? And then the type, and the type we set to text slash CSS, we're just instructing the browser how it should interpret this type of file. In this case, it's going to be ASCII text and it's going to contain CSS. So get ready for it. Okay. And then finally, media. And that's to be, I, we set it in this case all. We've seen it set to screen before as well. Uh, when we use the term all, we're basically saying that this, uh, these styles that are defined in this section of CSS are to be used on all screen sizes and all devices. But we can target specific media for certain styles. And that approach is the backbone to the notion of responsive web design, which I'll talk about briefly at the very end of the series. But this media attribute will take on an increasingly important role in modern web development as time goes on. So just be aware of that. Uh, so the link is one way that we can reference an external uh, CSS document. Another way to do it is to use an import statement inside of a CSS uh, file itself. So uh, we could use this inside of any CSS file at the very top, uh, the add symbol import, and then a URL inside of those open and close uh, parentheses. Uh, and why would you ever want to use this? Well, if you had styles that were specific to different page types, but all the page types had the same basic styles defined in the CSS, uh, in a main style.css file, then it could become very useful. So you think of using import as a means of establishing a dependency between style sheets. Uh, and frankly, I'm not gonna use this, so you can largely ignore it through the remainder of this series, but if you go to work in certain environments, uh, that is a tool that could be used to manage large style sheets, break them up by page type, but they can all reference a common uh, CSS file where the majority of the styles are defined, okay? Uh, so two things that I wanna interject at this point, and then we're gonna get our hands dirty writing some CSS of our very own. First thing to keep in mind before we continue is that the web browser has its own built-in style sheet. Uh, you might say, well, wait a second, what built-in style sheet? I think I've alluded to this already once or twice. So we've been working the entire time 
with a built-in style sheet. Whenever we create HTML, uh, Internet Explorer has to display it somehow. So that's why in lesson two, whenever we opened up, let's look at our after folder here. We open up our lesson 02. How is it that uh, the H1 is larger than the H2 and that the paragraphs have just this much margin above and below it? And how is it that, um, oh, I don't know. Let's see, don't we have, yeah, these uh, list items here. How are they uh, rendered using numbers as opposed to having nothing at all? Well, that's because there's a default style sheet. And when you define styles, uh, using cascading style sheets, you're overriding the default style sheet. And so later on at the very end of the series, I'll, I'll point you to a couple of reset style sheets uh, that will override all of the settings for the browser so that you can start from scratch, or at least you can get to a, a baseline. Now, some designers say you should never use somebody else's work. You should look through it and make it your own. Uh, so I'll repeat that caution later on but i just wanted to say that now when we're talking about reset.css which is a common style sheet that's used out on the internet just be aware of what it's attempting to do and that is to override the default uh, style sheet so it gets every web browser kind of back into just the just the most basic rendering of content so that you can build on top of it so the second thing I wanted to talk about before we continue on is that users can define their own personal style sheets that'll be applied to every web page. And I imagine that very few users consciously think of it in these terms. However, if they ever tell their web browser to use a larger font uh, in their uh, web browser, let's see where that is. Yeah, so under text size, I can use largest. And if I am counting on my font sizes to be a specific size based on a specific browser's rendering, I have to keep in mind, like in this particular case, by using a larger font, it pushed some of the content onto the next line. Now, the designer of this web page may have realized this and just decided not to worry about it because most uh, people don't mess with these settings. But I've had people tell me, hey, your web page doesn't look quite right in my web browser, and then I'll go off searching for the problem for days and days, only to realize that they have set their fonts or made some other changes that would affect the layout. And uh, in my particular case, everything was cattywampus. So the moral of the story is when it comes to designing web pages, trying to build a perfect design that's gonna work equally well in everybody's web browser is a fool's errand. It cannot be done, uh, at least I can't do it, okay? Uh, I can get close, but I can't guarantee it 100% of the time. I can get most cases, and then I guess everybody else is on their own. Uh, I don't get crazy about it. Uh, okay, so let's, let's move forward. Um, we're gonna get our hands dirty in code. I wanna point out a couple of things that I may or may not use while I'm coding. Uh, for example, the use of code comments. Uh, if you're familiar with other software development, you can use uh, uh, in C-sharp, for example, two forward slashes or a forward slash and an asterisk uh, to create a comment section. That allows me to get rid of certain code uh, temporarily by commenting it out or to write notes to myself that are not compiled. And you can do the same thing with cascading style sheets. So here you see a simple um, comment. Uh, I open the comment with a forward slash asterisk and then end the comment with a asterisk forward slash. And I could wrap those two around large passages of CSS in order to remove them from the web browser's rendering uh, temporarily during development time. So just be aware of that. Okay, so now let's move on to CSS selectors. Uh, if you recall from earlier, CSS selectors, how you attach a style to one or more HTML5 elements. Now we've already seen how tags like the H1 tag can be used as a CSS selector. However, there are many different CSS selectors available and we'll look at those in just a moment. So in addition to using tags as a selector, the most common CSS selectors are classes and IDs. If you recall from much earlier in the series, I said there were global attributes that can be used on all HTML5 elements like the ID and the class. The ID was a unique identifier that we could optionally add each HTML5 element that we wanted to access for the purpose of styling or scripting. 
classes were attributes that allowed us to further refine the semantic meaning of a given element. So we said at that time that we could apply a class to an element such as red text in order to make uh, the, uh, with the intent of making whatever that class was applied to red. Uh, but a better semantically correct class name might be important message and then style the text to be red, okay, using a red font. So now we can see the real value of using those global attributes of ID and class. They become hooks that we can use in CSS to style precisely what we want. Um, it also gives us a tremendous amount of flexibility. Take the class, for instance. A class, uh, let's say important message, could be used across many different tags, not just the paragraph or the H1. So we can apply a style uh, to many different tags, regardless of which type of element it is, as long as they share the same class in common, all right? Likewise, we can get very specific targeting a style at an individual element on our web page by creating a style for individual IDs. And there are so many combinations, it'll make your head spin, okay? And we're not going to be able to cover them all. One other thing I wanted to point out, because we didn't talk about it at the time, but whenever you define a class for a given HTML5 element, you can actually define multiple classes, like so. In this case, we have a div tag. The class equals, and I just created three arbitrary classes, my class one, my class two, my class three, with spaces in between each of them. And that basically says that it is a member of all three classes or that all three classes apply to this particular div tag. Uh, okay, so what I wanna do right now is actually wanna turn this off or back to medium. Okay, so now for the fun part. Uh, you should be able to download a folder called Lesson 12 from wherever you downloaded this video or where you're currently watching this video, inside of that zip file, there should be three folders, a before, after, and a work folder. What I want you to do is go to the before folder and copy the two files that are there, and put them in the work folder so that we don't mess up the originals here. And what I want to do is just double click on the lesson 12 in the work folder so you can see that we have a web page with a bunch of nonsensical lorem ipsum text which is it can be generated just a bunch of latin pig latin i'm not sure exactly which and it's just marked up with a bunch of html um it's more fun to look at the source code for this particular file because you can see things like span tags added into the middle of it with classes um, there's articles that contain paragraphs with ids with class references, there's spans that have uh, title attributes, and we'll use all of these to make different selections inside of the document. You can see there's an unordered list with some text inside of it. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and minimize that. Then we can take a look at the styles, which is blank, and it's a fertile playground for us to play in. So let's begin by styling up our H1, just to quickly demonstrate all selectors we're familiar with this one. In this case, I'm going to select font family as Arial and we'll set the color to purple. And let's go ahead and save that and then apply it to our style sheet. You can see we've changed both the font and the color of our H1. Great. Now, uh, also want to uh, select all the HTML5 elements that share the same class. And I happen to have a class used in a couple different spots called important. Uh, there's some paragraphs and some span tags that have important, and now we're going to make them pop out with the color red. So let's do that and refresh our document. You can see we have a span here that's got a class of important, and then two paragraphs at the very bottom of our page that have uh, the class important. Or we can reference individual elements by referencing their ID instead of the attributes. So we have an ID of one of the paragraphs called some such, because I couldn't think of a good name for it. And we'll set its color to blue. Let's see how that affects it. All right, so you can see this entire paragraph now is set to blue text. So those are your three primary uh, selectors, but there are tons of ways to uh, combine these. For example, um, let's 
look for just the span dot important. So we don't affect all spans, just the ones that are import uh, the spans that are important, and not all important classes, just those that belong to the span. And we'll color those in a dark red instead of just red. So now we should override that. And you can see if you look at your version of this, it'll look this red will look darker than this red. Okay, it at least it does on my screen. Um, and then additionally, what we can do in terms of combinations of things, and let me just make some space here, uh, is to uh, define a style that applies to multiple tags. And so we can use a comma for that. So like H1, H2, H3, comma, uh, and then P dot important. And we'll set the margin left to 50 pixels. And let's save that. So now I would expect everything that is an H1, H2, H3, or these uh, paragraphs that have a class of important, let's see what happens. They're going to move over to the right 50 pixels, and you see it worked. Great. All right, and then there are things like pseudo tags, which they have this interesting little syntax. For example, we talked about the anchor tag uh, and its various states and how to reset those states, uh, but we can style those states as well. So if you have a tag that's been visited, you can style it separately than a tag that, for example, um, hasn't been here. Let me start up here with a... So this is a tag that's not been, uh, a hyperlink that's not been clicked yet. So we'll go text decoration none and then we'll color it uh, green uh, yellow, which is a def one of the default colors. Then we will go uh, h.hover, and we'll merely add a uh, underline. And then for those that have been visited, we'll color them dark green so you know that you've already clicked that link all right so let's see this in action if I type that all in correctly let's refresh our web page all right so now you can see that uh, I've already visited this link let me go and to my internet options and let's delete my browsing history and then click OK and then shut it down and then open it back up and now it should look fresh again. There we go. So green bright green, this yellow, uh, green yellow color. And when I click on it to go to the page, in this case, wikipedia.org, we come back and it's now dark green. Notice also when I hover my mouse cursor over it, uh, a underline will appear. I'm not sure this is a great usability um, choice. Uh, it's not obvious that this is a hyperlink because it's missing its underline, but it's certainly a trick that some people use and they feel that they can style their web pages that way. And that's how they do it. All right, and then there are some new CSS level three selectors that are awfully funky, especially to those of us who've been doing this for a while. So for example, this is kind of cool. So, um, so every paragraph's first letter, I want to style it differently. And and I'm going to go font size, and we'll make it three times the size of a normal font. So let's do that and refresh. So now, whoops, let me look at my H. Uh, oh, 3 EM. <laughs> there we go. Now let's refresh. There we go. And notice there's this big leading character on every paragraph. Okay, it's kind of cool. Uh, you can also use a before and after. So we can select the space before and after. I'll just show the uh, the before article before. So in that space that's immediately before the article, I'm going to use this other special new thing called content. And I'm just going to put some um, uh, a line of asterisks. And I could also do the same thing with um, after to add some content after uh, whatever it is. So some people use it to put decorative fonts around divs and things of that nature. It's, it's definitely a good, uh, good approach for that. And you can see around before both of the articles that I have defined, we now have these asterisks. Okay, so a good way of inserting content. Uh, if you wanted to insert a URL, you could just go content URL and then do that. 
and then put the actual URL here, HTTP colon, or to whatever dot GIF, okay. <laughs> but for now, let's just go back to just a bunch of asterisks. Okay, so um, next up, the next pseudo tag that's been added with um, CSS level three, uh, first of type. So the very first paragraph in each section or each article uh, is what's implied here is that we're going to give it a margin right of 200 pixels. So we will indent it in from the right hand side, not make it stretch the entire length of or width rather of the web page. And you can see it indented it in dramatically for each first of type paragraph. Okay. Let's move on to these list items because there's some cool things we can do with these as well. Uh, or anything where we have this parent-child relationship. So uh, in this case, let's look for those list items that are the first child. And if you are a first child list item, then we're going to style you, style your font as an italic. And as we would expect, this very first list item is italicized. Uh, we can do the same thing with the last child. And so we'll go font, weight, bold. And again, we haven't talked about any of these uh, properties. That's what the remainder of the series is for right now. We're only focusing on these selectors, okay? Just to make sure you understand, we. I'm going to come back to those concepts and we're just kind of throwing these out here, but you can see now the last child is, um, uh, is weighted bold. And then we can also get to each of the individual items individually by going nth of type. So we want, for example, the third list item, every third list item on our web page and we'll set the text decoration to uh, underline. We just happen to have only one set of list items. So, but the one, two, third item notice is underlined. Cool. All right, so now I've got a bunch of spans that are defined somewhere down here and we're gonna start styling those up and uh, we can use these special selectors to do that. Uh, for example, any span that has an attribute of title, regardless of what title is set to, then we'll set its color to black. So now let's see those that have, uh, you can see there's one, two, three, four spans that we have set that each have a title attribute. Now we can even get more specific than that. For example, um, for those spans that have a title uh, of first idea, then we'll set the text uh, decoration uh, to line through. Let's see how that impacts it. So I would expect only one of these items to have a, a title of first idea. As I hover over, you can see it says first idea. Okay. And let's take a look at, here's two other really complex ones. Uh, somewhere I have a, uh, an anchor tag with an href that begins with, so that's the, the, uh, the operator for begins with the word email. So I can create an email hyperlink that when they click it, it'll automatically open up their email client and address it to the person that I put after uh, after the semicolons or after the colon rather. So just so you can see this for yourself, I have that defined here. So ahref colon bobtaber yahoo.com. All right, and when you click this text, it would send an email or start the process of sending an email to bobtaberyahoo.com, all right? So let's close that back down. And I, I can select all anchor tags where the href, the value of the href begins with the word email. Poof, 
that's pretty cool, right? So I, then I can style up that entire anchor tag uh, and set the font size to 2EM, for example. And refresh. All right, and it makes it huge, but now I could click that and send an email to myself if I really wanted to. And then um, I guess the last one we'll look at here is kind of along the same lines. So we'll look for the span with where the title attribute ends with, so that's the ends with operator, uh, idea. And we'll set its text decoration to overline. And we'll save that. And I think I have two of those, I do. First idea and third idea. All right, they both end with the word idea. And so we put an overline decoration on that text. Okay, and there's there's several others that I just didn't take the time to incorporate into this example. Let me just pop them here on screen. Uh, there are descendants. So in this case, article span, it would select uh, all el span elements that are descendants of article, as opposed to span elements that are descendants of section or some, some other you know tag. Uh, then there's um, where you can use an asterisk character, which means universal. So give me any uh, tag within this other tag a regardless of b's parents okay and then there's you've seen this use the direct child where um, uh, the list item is a direct child of an, an ordered list so style up those list items uh, and there's also for jason siblings and just siblings in general and there's tons and tons of other selectors you really need a reference of some sort maybe a, a wall poster or a little cheat sheet card or something uh, especially as you're as you're learning them, I'd probably encourage you to keep your CSS as simple as possible for as long as possible, and only resort to some of these special cases when there's no easy way to get at it. I wouldn't be I wouldn't be poking around these hard ones because they have unintended consequences sometimes. In my experience, I try to keep things simple. My brain works that way. <laughs> okay, uh, but at any rate, the moral of the story is that there's more than one way to attach a style to a specific element of your document. You can get really creative with especially uh, some of the new CSS level three selectors that are available. All right, one more topic I think is of extreme importance. Uh, there clearly will be collisions between styles that you've defined. There's a prescribed order in which the styles will be applied and certain property definitions can be overridden. So if you define a style, all the children of that element will inherit the style. This applies to some styles, mostly text, font, table, and list properties. So if you take a look at, for example, a parent-child relationship where we set a style on the parent and it affected the child, take a look at our Lesson 03 example and look at the after folder where we set a style on our header section and we set the color white. Now the header itself its color was black, its background color was black, but now any text inside of so any children of the header, I think there was an H1 and H2, and then there were some other, the links, but they were, they were styled a little bit differently. But any children's text for color would be white. All right, so that's a good example of that idea. So there's a sense of inheritance. And you can also control inheritance uh, using a, uh, the, the following values that you see on screen. So there's inherit, which means it forces a property to be inherited uh, from its parent that normally wouldn't be inherited or it overrides other applied style values and it inherits the parent's value. Uh, there's also none, normal, and auto. So again, find a good reference, make sure you understand what those do and when to apply them so that you can take control of inheritance if you really want to for a given element. There's also something called important and uh, it gives maximum weight. In a moment, we're gonna talk about the precedence of things. However, we can take something that would normally have a low precedence and bring it up very high in the chain by attaching this important uh, off to the right-hand side of that particular style definition. So in this case, we'll, any H1 will try to really, really, really push the fact that its color, for color is red, even if other style sheets at different levels in the process would say otherwise, okay? And so let's go ahead and talk about cascading order. 
Generally, the last defined style is the one that's used. But in case of a conflict, the following order of importance is used. At the very top, the user's own style preferences, so their own style sheet, will be uh, honored. So uh, if I set in my web browser the font size to large, there's not a whole lot that you as a designer can do about it. I'm going to force that issue because the user will have the highest precedence. Uh, let me jump all the way to the bottom will be the browser's default. So we are able to easily override the default style sheet by defining a style at any other level in between user and the browser's default. Uh, most of what we do is uh, uh, with regards to either inline styles, and you can see that that has a very high precedence. Um, there's also this importance that we just talked about a moment ago. Uh, specificity, so that means if I define a, a style for an ID, it will take precedence over a, uh, a style that was defined just generally for that tag. So if I have an ID of uh, some such, but I have the paragraph tag is defined uh, even lower down in, uh, in my document, the, uh, the one that has specificity will override it. Next down in importance is the order of things. So we saw just a moment ago how we defined, let me see if I can find that. Uh, there was a, a span that had first idea and then a span that had where it ended with the word idea. And this order, the last one, has precedent over the one that was defined higher up. So as you move through your style sheet, the ones that are lower and lower have greater precedence, all right? So hopefully that made sense. Um, it's just think in terms, something is overriding what I've done. And there's a cool tool that's built in Internet Explorer to help you see how that really works. If I were to open up my web page one more time and then go back to the F12 developer tools uh, in my little tool section here, my little tool icon, uh, it'll open up this, this little dialog at the very bottom of my page. And the neat thing about it is I can go to this CSS side and I can click this arrow and then start hovering my mouse cursor over things and it starts a selection window. And when I select something, it will show me all the styles that have been applied and the source of that style. Now in my case, I only have styles defined in this styles.css page. But if I had like four or five CSS pages, it would say where it got the style from, okay? Um, and you can use this on any web page over the internet to see how they did what they did. And this is the best way to learn CSS. You look at a web page, you say, wow, that's cool. I wonder how they did that. And you spend about a half hour, an hour dissecting what they did using a tool like this. Um, okay, so you can see in this case, I've selected this. Notice that there are a number of uh, a number of styles could be applied to it. For example, the paragraph itself. But since this wasn't the first letter, it struck that out because it didn't uh, deem that necessary. I guess uh, it's also regarded as important, and therefore it should be styled as red. However, we specified the span. Uh, of title, which takes precedence over important because it's lo deeper down on the style.css page, and it said it's color to black. The same is true with the span uh, where we set the text decoration, and notice that that has a line through it because something more specific or later down in the document overwrote it, and so that's why it now has an overline. And so we can just kind of go around and inspect the various parts of our web page and learn about what takes precedence and why. And furthermore, what we can do, which is kind of cool, when we're trying to understand better how to style something and we're getting frustrated, and it uh, would be convenient for us to turn off or turn on styles. So I'm turning on and turning off by clicking these little uh, check marks and saying, what would it look like if I included that or removed it? Oh, I guess I didn't need that style in the first place. How about if I remove that? Oh, that's closer to what I wanted. Or you can at least see how it affects uh, um, uh, the document in real time. Awesome debugging tool, awesome development tool, awesome uh, learning tool, okay? So keep in mind, F12 developer tools, it's there for you to use exactly the way that we're demonstrating it here. Okay, um, so we've covered a lot of ground in this short period of time. Uh, what's up next is looking at the types of CSS properties that can be set. We've already given you a preview of that a number of times, but now we're going to start talking about 
each of those at least in a high at a high level there are families of properties and i've split up the next four videos as follows we'll talk about properties that affect the font and the text properties that affect the color and background properties that affect lists and tables specifically and then uh properties that affect block or box style html5 elements and we'll talk more about what those are uh when we get to that point okay so to wrap up we've seen how to define styles how to attach them to specific html5 elements using the css selector syntax we talked about how styles are applied how they're overridden how they're honored through a very specific sequence uh and order of of uh, precedence we've used the f12 developer tools man we've learned a lot i hope you enjoyed it stay tuned you've the hardest part is over i promise you it's all downhill from here we'll see you in the next video thank you In the previous lesson, we talked about CSS at a high level, and then we discussed the various CSS selectors at length. Now we're going to begin the process of examining the CSS properties that can be set focusing first on font and text related CSS properties and then moving on from there in subsequent lessons. Now for the next four videos, I did a little experiment. Uh, you can use what I did, or I would encourage you to spend a few days and take the approach that I took and do the exact same thing on your own. But I basically went through almost every single CSS property, uh, and then I created a cheat sheet for it. And so I created a few web pages, one for each video in this case, uh, that utilize the actual CSS properties in all possible settings so that I could ensure I knew what I was talking about for this video series. It was a great learning experience. I highly recommend you do the same. It is time consuming, but what you need to do is find a, a website, a book, something that references every single CSS property, and then begin just typing out like I did. Here, let me show you the source uh, to this. Actually, it'll, this will be in its own folder by the time it gets to you. But you can see what I did here. Uh, very simple. Just created um, a heading and then styled number of paragraphs. In this case, I used inline styles. Again, I wouldn't recommend that you did the, do this in a real application. But in this case, I just wanted a quick down and dirty way of getting that style information into every paragraph without having to find a thousand styles in an external style sheet. Okay. So I just use the inline style, um, attribute. And so you can see here where I've set the font family to various fonts, the font sizes, font weights, and so on. And just went through and created this cheat sheet for myself. And now I feel prepared to have this conversation. And then also it was a good refresher for some things that I'd already known. But what I want to do in the course of this video then is just review this this cheat sheet that I created for myself and uh, call your attention to several properties that might need a little elaboration. Uh, for example, we can start with the font family. Uh, the font's typeface is called the font family. In fact, you can stack them, although I didn't do that here in this. You many times will see them stacked like you see on the screen right here. Um, and the reason you stack them is to make uh, backups for selection. So the browser, if it doesn't have access, for example, to the Arial font, it'll look for Helvetica. If it doesn't have uh, access to the Helvetica font on the person's system or device, then it will look for any sans serif font. And so this is a means of just stacking up the fonts, making sure that there are adequate substitutes in case somebody doesn't have a specific font on their system. All right. Moving on, uh, I think one of the most confusing things about working with cascading style sheets is how many different ways you can define sizes of things like fonts and text related uh, sizes as we'll see a little bit in a moment. There are basically four ways to define sizes. Uh, the first is a point and a point is traditionally used in print media. Uh, one point is exactly 1 72nd of an inch. Uh, they are fixed in size, they cannot be scaled. The problem with the point is that it's really dependent on the resolution of the computer screen, not the actual size that's rendered on the monitor. In other words, I could be running at a small 13 inch screen at 1280 by 720 resolution or a very large screen at 1280 by uh, 720 and uh, neither of these will be one uh, one point 
won't be one seventy second of an actual inch. So points are generally considered a bad idea in web design, especially since they don't scale upward or downward to fit the given device that they're displayed on. Then there's pixels or PX like we've used a couple of times up to now. And pixels are another fixed size unit used for screen media. A pixel is supposed to be equal to one dot on the computer screen, a single pixel of the screen. However, here again, pixels don't take into consideration the screen resolution, so they're not really a reliable measure. Uh, furthermore, again, they're fixed so they don't scale upward or downward to fit the given device that they're displayed on. Then you have EMS, EMS, or M. EM, a scalable unit that's used in web document media. And M is equal to the current font size set by the browser. So if the font size of the current web document is 12 points, then one EM is equal to 12 points. Two EMs would be 24 points and so on. It kind of works like percentages. If you want a 20% larger uh, font than what the default document has defined as the normal font, then you would use 1.2 EM, all right? And then there's percentages, and this is a lot like EMs, except it's expressed in actual percentages, not decimals. So 100% is equal to 12 points, 200% is 24 points, and so on. Now there's a couple of great articles out on the internet. Let me copy one and put it uh, here. So I really enjoyed this article. I think that uh, it does a really good job of explaining what I just said in a little more detail with some, with some obvious uh, examples here and some good uh, upsides and downsides. As some people note in the comments, this article is a couple of years old now and and perhaps some of these things it was written in 2008. So some of these things may have changed as styles and browsers have been updated. So keep that in consideration, uh, but I haven't found a better source than this quite honestly. Um, and there are endless debates on the internet on which way is the best way and why. And I'm not sure what to tell you, quite honestly. As of now, the most popular way seems to be to define sizes in a relative manner using M's or percentages. But some people swear by pixels for fixed sizes because they don't want to relinquish uh, the size of the font to uh, the user and when they change the sizes in the browser, but the people are going to do that anyway, quite frankly. So to add to the confusion, there are relative name sizes and named weights and so on. So if you take a look here, uh, we have not only uh, the font size expressed in M's percentages and pixels, but also there's a number of name sizes like small or small, which look about the same on Internet Explorer, medium, large, larger, which look about the same, extra large and XX large. Okay. So again, another relative way of defining sizes. As I've recommended several times up to now, pick a style and stick with it, uh, unless you have a reason not to. Next up are font weights, and you can see that there are named weights as well as font weights from uh, 100 to 900, with 900 being the thickest. I think, again, it depends on the font that's available to the computer, how it's able to render its thickness, uh, so keep that in mind. Um, as we kind of scroll down, font style is pretty obvious. Font variant, variant we've already used uh, the small caps variant. Uh, letter spacing and word spacing just expressed in M's, how each letter should be spaced or each word should be spaced uh, between uh, each word. Uh, line height, I've demonstrated two styles with a normal and with uh, I think a two EM where there's a bunch of space in between each line. Uh, text transform uppercase, maybe that's one that I used in lesson three, I can't quite recall. Text alignment, uh, vertical line, and vertical line has to do with the text that it's butted up next to. So in this case, I have some very large text, and then the text next to it will be aligned relative to its, um, its, uh, its neighbor. So in this case, vertical align top puts it at this top section of the serif font, whereas a, a super, you can see vertical align super puts it at the top line of the capital letter, not the lowercase, uh, um, I guess, imaginary line for the serifs. Again, the same would be true for subs and bottoms baselines and so on. So that's a good reference to see exactly uh, what, to, uh, what to expect whenever you're working with the vertical alignment. Text indent in terms of pixels, how much from the left hand side should be indented. Uh, white space, there are three settings, normal, pre, and no wrap. Pre will include any uh, 
empty spaces, white spaces, uh, in the rendering of it and will not wrap to another line. No wrap ignores the white space and will not wrap to another line. Okay, so that's the difference between those two. And then finally, there's text decoration. We've already used underline, overline, and line through in the previous lesson just to demonstrate some selectors and to call out attention to some uh, of the selectors that we've created. All right, so, you know, it's as simple as that. Um, uh, what remains in the rest of the series of videos is pretty much a similar format to what we've done here. Just a review of the types of properties that can be set and the properties that they can be set to, calling your attention to ones that need a little more explanation. So we'll pick it back up in the next lesson. We'll see you there. Thank you. In this lesson, we'll talk about color and background related CSS properties. Now, some HTML5 elements can have a foreground color or just color, while others can have a background color, while others can have a, a background image, and that image can be configured in a number of different ways. So to kind of exercise this, I created another one of my little experiments like I talked about in the previous lesson, where I went through and just created every variation possible so that I could get this firmly ensconced in my mind as the differences, what the different values were uh, possibly, and be able to talk about this intelligently. Great exercise. I highly recommend that you do something similar to this for yourself. Create a little cheat sheet, okay? So we're gonna start with various ways to define color in CSS, and there are quite a few actually. The three ways that I have demonstrated here are defining using uh, named colors like blue, black, white, red, so on. And there's uh, quite a few. I think there's, uh, I don't know, 120, 240. Uh, it's several, uh, several dozen different ways uh, and you can just search for uh, CSS color named and uh, Bing will bring back some websites that have a definitive list of every possible value you could look for and that's the way I usually do it when I go about to work with colors. Uh, or you can use a hexadecimal value and a lot of uh, applications like Photoshop and my preference is Fireworks but there are other tools as well that use hexadecimal values uh, whenever you're um, kind of laying out what your web page might look like. Uh, and then there's also RGB values, which stands for red, green, blue. And the combination of those uh, values between 0 and 255 will create every color that's possible, at least, you know, uh, that are web safe anyway. There are a number of other different ways to define colors as well. Uh, RGB percentages. There's uh, something called HSL, which stands for hue, saturation, and lightness. Then there's RGBA and HSLA, which uh, are uh, include alpha transparency as well. And so, you know, for me personally, I stick with either name colors or hexadecimal values for consistency sake. Still, if you're so inclined, you're probably more likely if you have a tool that automatically generates these values for you, then you can use any of these ways in defining a color in CSS. So you can see that in several of these cases, uh, I work with div tags. If you were to look at the HTML for lesson 14, and uh, the div semantically is probably correct for this because we're not really giving any true meaning to our document, just a general area that we can style, so I feel good about that. Um, and you can see in this case I have the style attribute and I start defining in line the various styles. So in this case I set a background color as well as the sizing of the div itself and the margins for spacing purposes or what have you. That's not as interesting as the actual values we've set here. For example, using a hexadecimal value I can get a light gray color in my div. Here I'm going to set background images background image set to none leaves it empty uh, or I can use uh, an image in this case a 50 by 50 image uh, where did I get this from it's a funny little utility that somebody put out there called uh, placekitten.com and you can use these as placeholders on your web pages you just send in a width and a height uh, formatted like so and it will give you back an image that you can use temporarily on your website as you're do, going through development. Okay, so I just use that for this purpose. Um, so you can see uh, by default it will tile uh, your image to fit the space available within 
your uh, your block style element. We'll talk about block style elements when we talk about block properties two lessons from now, okay? Uh, here we can set the properties of the background. Uh, by default, you can see it will repeat, or we can set repeat X to only tile our background image uh, um, using the X axis or vertically, or rather horizontally, and then use the repeat Y value to repeat that tile um, uh, vertically. Or we can use the no repeat, which will only put the image in your background of whatever element just one time. Uh, furthermore, you can set the background position so that you can position it, in this case, right top, left bottom, so and so on. There's also a background attachment. However, it seems to be only applicable to the entire web page, and so I didn't create a firm example of this. You can see how it's used uh, here. Uh, there's two possibilities, scroll and fixed. The scroll uh, means that the background image does scroll with the page, whereas fixed means the background image does not scroll when you scroll the web page, okay? And then finally, I wanted to point out that many of these uh, CSS properties will accept shorthand. So you can kind of stack all of the settings on a single line if you want to. Same thing with, with border, as we'll see, and uh, uh, I think font has that capability as well. In this case, you just need to put the color or image, optionally put the position, optionally put the repeat, optionally put the attachment value and so on, and it will figure it out, okay? So that's really all I have to say about it. Again, a valuable exercise for me. Background colors, background images used often in web development. Make sure if you're, you're at least familiar with uh, the various properties and then just experiment as you're building your web pages. So hope that helps.